they don't want anybody asking questions about right. what it is that's going on. Right. And that's why people end up coming to see people like me that do believe in it. Yeah. Because, because they know that something is going on that the doctors are don't. not even prepared to look at. They're just not even prepared to look at it. All they want to do is put them on, on medication. Right. That's it. I mean, this it's fascinating. And if this is if this was widely known throughout humanity, you could help heal the majority of humanity like that. Exactly. Yep. And that's yep. why they don't want it to become widely known. Because if people understood that we're not just physical bodies and physical beings. We have this energetic body as well. The energetic body is connected to the emotional body. So when you have a trauma and it's a really significant trauma, the emotions that you feel around that horrendous trauma will be connected to one of your energy centers. And as soon as that energy center becomes impacted, it's like a magnetic draw to these parasitical beings. Yes. And they, they, it's like the smell of food to us. Right. I, you know, I use it like shark smell and blood. Exactly that. Yeah. They are attracted to it straight away. Right. They slot in and then they start siphoning that person's energy center energy. Right. into them. So right. then we become batteries to fuel their parasitical world. Right. Hi everybody, this is JCK from Quantum Truths JCK and I am in an absolute I'm absolutely thrilled today because I have two guests that I am I'm so uh, respectful of and I hold them in the highest esteem and they're both psychotherapists by profession and they're both seeing things from a a vastly different way than what the establishment will see things. And I wanted both of them to come on, and they have been guests on my show before. And so I have uh, both Jerry Marzinski and Laura Whitworth here with me, and I'm so thrilled that you both agreed to come on together. Jerry was on my show recently. Laura and I talk all the time, but we've done about two shows together, I think, and um, one in person when I went to England to, and I, I got to go and meet you, and I stayed with you. So um, Jerry had all of these guests last time that he was suggesting for me to have on, but I thought to myself, I wanted to have someone he's never spoken to before So, because I know that you're both seeing things the same and you could both back each other up. You both got the same sort of backgrounds and uh, the vast case studies that you've both seen can start to get to the nitty-gritty of what is happening in this unseen world that is affecting so many of your clients and your patients. And so if you weren't here last time, I'll just get Jerry to introduce himself and Laura to introduce yourself and what you do. So please go ahead, Jerry. Tell us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. Um, I've got, you know, four years of undergraduate. This is this is the formal stuff where I, I, I didn't really learn anything in, until I got to the front lines. The four years of undergraduate psychology and four years of graduate school in psychology and counseling. Um, I'm a commercial pilot. Uh, um, I like riding motorcycles. I've, I've been working in places that you guys would never be able to get into. Uh, in, in your lifetime. So I started off working at one of the biggest psychiatric hospitals on the planet uh, back in the 70s, Central State Hospital in Millville, Georgia. There were close to 10,000 10, patients there when I got there. It uh, 200 buildings and it sprawled over like 3,000 acres. So for somebody who was interested in ab abnormal psychology, it was like a candy store. You know, it was like everything, every mental illness known to man was there. Uh, so I spent seven years studying uh, 
schizophrenics and and the voices that they were hearing while there i, I started off there and then uh went back in, into a phd program wasn't learning anything worthwhile there it wasn't didn't relate to anything clinical uh so it, I, I moved down to arizona uh worked in mental health centers for a while and then spent uh like I think 17 years working with the criminally insane in the Georgia state prison system, which is where I learned a lot of stuff because in the, uh, in the state hospital, when the psychiatrist found I was asking these patients about what the voices were telling them, it would be like, you're not, you're not to do that. The voices are hallucinations, you know, stop it. What you're doing is you're reinforcing the hallucinations and you're making them worse. Twice I ended up in front of psychiatrists being ordered to stop asking questions. Um, so where I where I learned the most was in the uh, prison system, where I was able to choose uh, inmates who were willing to tell me in real time what the voices were telling them, and <clears throat> experiment with different ways to upset the patterns that I saw that they were running. So, uh, you know, here's psychiatry insisting that they're hallucinations. And here I am finding repetitive, repeatable, predictable patterns that these voices run like they were all made in some strange, you know, cookie cutting factory that they, they all they were all running the same same patterns. So I, I was experimenting with different ways to interfere with those patterns and eventually uh, people started recovering, and and then I got in trouble for that because that wasn't supposed to happen, you know. So uh, that's where I spent nearly fifty years working in these institutions that they would never let researchers into. They would never let anybody who wasn't completely brainwashed with their way of thinking in there, you know. And any researcher who tries to get in there is, is going to be denied access. They, uh, I've come to the conclusion that they do not want a a cure for schizophrenia. They're making what thirty four billion dollars a year selling antipsychotic drugs around the world. They don't want a cure. You know, they want you to keep paying for psych psychiatric visits and and these drugs and supporting the the uh, pharmaceutical industry. You know, and they're not going to find a cure in those drugs. Those drugs don't cure anything. Yeah, so that's a little bit about my background. Thanks, Jerry. That's fantastic. And just to remind everyone, Jerry's had over 35 years experience uh, on the front lines and continuing now. So he's in private practice now. This is why he can speak out about what his experiences are, particularly with schizophrenia and other psychosis um mental illness uh, conditions. And now we have also Laura Whitworth. Laura, I'm inviting you on. Now, most of you may know Laura Whitworth um, as a clinical hypnotherapist who has her own um, practice called Soul Center Healing Hypnosis. A lot of you have done her course. Uh, a lot of you might have had a session. However, Many of you may not know that Laura also is a professional psychotherapist. And so, Laura, please tell us more about your background and, and what your work is entailing. So I am a clinical psychotherapist, hypnotherapist and quantum healer. And when I came into this work, I had no idea to start off with when I was hypnotizing people, what these voices were that were coming out of people. And it would be a very particular client. Um, and I started to realize that you could almost sense the energy of that type of client where you were going to get these voices. And you would take them into an altered brainwave state. You take them down into a theta brainwave state. And many people would start to swear at you, to curse at you. Some people would begin to writhe on the bed. And the voices would be very different from the person that you've just spent the past two hours talking to. So doing a psychotherapy session with prior to the hypnotherapy. And I started to document what was going on because I wanted to understand it more myself. And like Jerry, I've always been very, very inquisitive. I've never listened to what people tell me. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's got me into a lot of trouble over the years. Yeah, um, yeah. But but essentially, we were taught, you know, don't question this. Um, and that didn't sit well with me because I knew there was something more. I knew there was there was something more going on. So I started to re- to read everything that I could regarding um, spirit releasement therapy, uh, possession, uh, exorcism, you know, near death experiences. I literally devoured everything, everything in terms of ancient history and um, all of the things outside of the box. I start to learn about the energetic body, what it is, the chakras. I know some people say chakras, I say chakras. And I started to document every single client that came to see me, their particular traumas, where that particular trauma connected to a, an energy center to see if I could find patterns between their emotional states and their physical ailments and the voices that would come up in the session and what I started to realize over time is that there are energetic beings that exist in a dimension and I know this is hard for many many people to wrap their heads around but there is a band of light that the human eye cannot see we can only see 40 percent of the available spectrum of all that is and there is a band of light that we cannot see with the naked human eye that these beings exist within They are a lower frequency than what we can see. They're attracted to the pain that we feel through Mm -hmm. the traumas that we go through. And these beings all have, when you work with thousands of them, they all have different personalities. So the different types of beings that you find will correlate to certain energy centers as well. So the more that you work with clients that have these voices that, you know, we might be told is schizophrenia, you start to realize that it is these energetic beings that are attached to one of their energy centers. Sometimes people have one in every single energy center. Every single energy center is taken. And then not only do these beings siphon that human's energy away, but they also, because they're connected to their energetic body, can influence that person's consciousness. And that's where the talking to the voices comes in because these people can hear them because they're a part of their consciousness as they have attached. So it's become my life's mission, if you like, to raise awareness about this. And day in, day out, when I'm not homeschooling my children, I am working with clients to ascertain what traumas they've had, whereabouts their energy body is affected where the entities are, removing these energetic beings, cleaning up the client's energy body, and then they don't hear the voices anymore. The voices disappear. I agree with virtually everything you said. These are energetic beings. They are able to insert thoughts into your thought stream. So we're we're taught from the time we're small children that whatever thought appears in your head belongs to you. Yeah. That's a common misconception. Emanuel Swedenborg, 300 years ago, pointed out that no, he, he says that none of your thoughts belong to you. But you know, what, where they get you, is, and they get us all, is they're able to insert thoughts into your thought stream. And these are negative, abusive, derogatory thoughts that generate that negative emotional energy that you were talking about that they feed off of. And that's one thing I noticed in you know, the state hospitals, the psychiatric hospitals, the private psychiatric, it, it's consistent. When the voice, after the voice is attacked, the patient is completely drained. Yeah, They, they don't have any energy. And I was wondering about that I, for years, probably for more than a decade. I thought it was because of the the absolute nasty abuse that that they're constantly hitting these people with and i'm i was thinking well if, if something was telling me i was rotten stupid ugly worthless constantly 24 hours a day i think it would it would wear you down but i was working in the state prison and i was i, I always got assigned to, mostly to the the worst most violent units and that was okay cuz i was like a adrenaline junkie anyway so that was that worked out fine and uh I was working for the jail for the prison. 
This, this is where the worst of the worst from the entire prison ended up. I walked into my office one day in, in one of the other units, and here was an inmate letter from an inmate who was in the jail in another unit living with a florid schizophrenic who was standing over him at three in the morning and just staring down at him, you know, yeah. pacing the cell all night, not sleeping, talking to voices, acting very strange. This guy was sane, but he was put in there, and I looked him up on the computer before I went over there. He was put in there for snitching off uh, the Aryan Mafia, a very violent drug gang. They lost their drugs. They they broke up the gang, and they sent him to prisons all over the state. So they wanted this guy dead. They'd already stabbed him once, and he was put in there for protective custody. So they locked him into a little 8 by 10 room with this florid psychotic guy, and and here they are stuck together. And then right after I saw that inmate letter, I got another call from the captain of that unit. Said, come on over here. These guys are, are, are they're having some trouble in there. You need to do something. So I went over there and I called up the um, the guy who was sane first, the, the guy that the, the, he, they, the gangsters have already stabbed him once. They wanted him dead so bad <clears throat> that they... A couple of them got in trouble just so they could get over there and have a chance to get at this guy. So here they were sticking notes under his door saying, we're here. We're waiting to get you. You know, you're dead. As soon as we get our hands on you, you're gone. So he's getting these notes under his door and he's stuck in there with this florid psychotic staring down at him at three in the morning. He wakes up and this guy's looking down at him. You know, you can't be under too much more stress locked in there in that tiny cell. They only let him out one day or one hour a day. So I called that guy up first and watched him come up the steps. He had plenty of energy. He comes up, he, he walks across, he gets comes in the office, sits down. He was anxious, he was nervous, but he had plenty of energy. His, his, uh, he was coherent. Uh, you know, his, his uh, speech was appropriate. And, you know, except for being very nervous, he was fairly, you know, he had plenty of energy. You know, so I'm thinking that's odd, you know, being locked in there. Then I called up the schizophrenic who was being attacked by voices constantly. And I watched him come up the staircase and he had to hold the, the banister. He walked slowly, kind of shuffled into the office, sat down, slumped back in the chair and uh, asked him, you hearing voices? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing voices all the time. You know, so after interviewing him, and comparing these two, I went. It, it's it's not it's it's not the anxiety. It's it's not the it's not the threat. There's something else going on here, you know. So here's its pattern of the voices striking and the energy disappearing, and then finding out. That now there, it was a perfect experimental situation. I mean, everything was the same. It was the same cell, the same guards, the same food, everything. There was no interfering factors. They you couldn't have a better experimental situation. I walked out of there. I go, it, it's not the anxiety. Something is taking their energy. Yeah. yeah. But when you ask them, where does the energy go? They go, I don't know. They have no idea. It's going they, into they, that, that other being. Yeah. Some of them would realize that when you ask them, well, if you didn't use it, where else would it go? Some yeah. of them would say, well, they take it, you know, like questioning. But they, it's like they never thought about it before. Yeah, it, it's it's just like okay after after the attack of the voices, it, it, it you know it's they just don't think about it. It's like it's blocked out of their consciousness that their energy is leaving, and that being will manipulate that individual emotionally in the perfect way because it will learn all of the things that trigger that individual, all of the little raw points that that person feels really upset and sad and worried about. And it will manipulate those particular trigger points to get the exact sweet amount of energy that that entity needs. And what you'll then get is you'll get relationships in 3D, if you like, in our world, where you'll have two entities working together on two different people so you'll have an entity that really really gets off on the um the controlling energy the dominating people the hurting people 
and that entity will be on the abuser in in this in the 3D world and then you'll have an entity that's attached to the one that's being abused that feeds off of the energy that's released by that individual when they are being abused so you oh, get all of wow. these really wow. really curious relationships that are occurring and it's fascinating you know when you start to study it and you can plot the the different personalities of demon yeah. that will attach to the abuser and the abusee. Oh, I never thought of it that way. But what I did see is that they they these are energetic beings. So where, where they exist, there is no space, there is no time, there is no matter. No. So, right. so they can go into the victim's mind and access their memory. They can pull up every rotten thing they've ever done and they can rub it in their face until they start generating that negative emotional energy that they feed off of. Mm. And I've had patients, you know, say stuff that they'd forgotten 20 years ago, but yeah. these things would go in there and they'd pull up and they'd start rubbing it in their face. Like if somebody didn't pay back a 25 cent debt or something to some poor guy 25 years ago. And, and here's this entity rubbing it in his face. Yeah. yeah. So that so they know what you've done. You know, they have access to all that. And they bring it up and they put it in your thought stream. So they're like fishermen. They they'll grab something, they'll put it on the hook, they'll throw it into your, your mental stream coming into your consciousness and see if they bite on it. Yeah. And if they bite on it, they just kind of okay, let's go, let's go for it. Let's reel them in, man. They get them for all they all they're worth. Yeah. So you know, it the big thing with psychiatry is is its lie that these things are hallucinations you know psychiatry reminds me of the old egyptian priest they, they get up there and they go we hereby declare that the voices are hallucinations because we're psychiatry and we went to school or you know, you know they haven't studied this stuff no. they don't have no idea what they are they just had to some come up with some explanation that fit their agenda of power mm. and control so you know, if you look at these things, these are energetic beings. Okay, they, yeah, it, it it's like a magnetic field. Okay, it, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it. It, it, it that that field around that magnet is invisible. It's not you can't sense it with any of our senses. So you, it, once you get iron filings and you put that magnetic field up near a jar with iron filings now you can see the field okay so the same thing with gravity you can't see it you know you can see its effect on physical reality yeah. so what i had been studying from the time i started were the patterns that these voices ran so you can't actually see the voices you know normal people can't touch them they can't feel them they they, they can't you know, they, they, they're they inaccessible to them, but they can see the result. And these patterns that they run, if they're running fixed, predictable, repeatable patterns, they cannot be hallucinations. So what psychiatry mm -hmm. and, the, and the psychiatric mafia and big pharma have done, they started out blaming mothers. You know, oh, the mothers did something wrong. They, they screwed up. That's why these people are schizophrenic. But mothers could see this. People could see this. They could verify that for themselves. And they went, well, this is bull crap. You know, I didn't do any of that stuff to cause this stuff. So what they did is they kicked it up another category into the genetic area and say, oh, it's a, there's a gene malfunction. There's a, a genetic disposition. There's something with the genes. And they ran with that for years. You know, now, what psychiatrist, what doctor, what what clinical person, what psychologist can access a gene lab and check that out for themselves? No, they've made that unreachable and put it into a province where the average guy could not verify that at all. And they ran with it for years, you know, saying, oh, the only thing you can do is take these meds because it's a genetic malfunction. So some more reliable researchers finally caught on to that and said, we don't find a genetic predisposition for schizophrenia. There's, it doesn't exist. So, Jerry, can you so, tell us tell us about the patterns that uh, I know you've got a huge list of them, so I'd really like you to explain the patterns because I, I do have a lot of questions for both of you, and I think that already you both have dived deep and 
uh, we're already shaping that there's something there. And I guess the two main questions would be, uh, you know, what are the voices and how can we help people, these voices? Okay. But another, so, so another are, question I would have is also what are thoughts? But for now, let's, well, let's talk about yeah. the patterns and then okay. um, we can map a picture of what's going on. Okay. With Laura, you, you jump in. I'm, I'm going to shoot these off one by one. I'm sure you've seen these things. But what I want to point out is, you know, they went from the genetics to they went to the chemical imbalance theory. You yeah. know, it's due to a chemical imbalance. One thing I noticed when I was working at the state hospital, that they didn't do any baseline. They didn't give any labs. They didn't give any tests. They didn't give any EKG, EEG, no kind of hardcore lab work or anything to find a baseline. And it, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Eli Lilly that came up with this chemical imbalance thing to try to explain you know, what schizophrenia was back in the 70s when they came out with Prozac. They yeah. made it up. They completely just made it up. They knew it was a lie at the time, but they didn't have any other explanations. So they made one up and then they brainwashed the public with this garbage with millions of dollars worth of advertisement. And again, it was again in a province that the average person, the average psychiatrist, the average doctor could not de, de verify. You know, it's up and now you're in a uh, biochemical lab with specialists and special equipment. So here they brought it out of the reach of the general population and just spewed out this tons of toxic propaganda, making people believe that this is a chemical imbalance. And the only thing you could do is take their toxic medications. They would tell these patients, this is a life sentence. You have to take these drugs. You have to come back to us, pay us $150 a visit. You know, and I think it's about $900 for a month's worth of prescriptions for any psychotic drugs. It's a, it's a, it's a drug fueled, sick, dysfunctional mental health system. It doesn't work. None of those drugs cure anything. They and don't the, do anything. And the mental health system is actually uh, an example of what is controlling what these is. voices. Uh, well, it is a, part of. It is part of the system. It's part of it. It's part of this system. Yeah. So tell us about these um, checklists, this this uh, list of th of uh, patterns that they run that you've okay. gathered together from thousands of clients over these decades. Okay. So what I want to point out is every single one of these is verifiable by anybody who's working with a schizophrenic or has one in their family. You know, this will knock out. The psychiatric mafia is bullcrap about there being a, a chemical imbalance. They don't even know what the chemical balance of the brain should be. They have no baseline. They don't. They have no idea. They don't even know what's out of balance or by how much. You know. And you look. Anybody who goes to a psychiatrist, see if they give you any kind of test to find out what neurotransmitters are out of balance or by how much. No. They, they just, just go and they pick they a just, drug and start with that. And they're just relying on the fact that people will not question it. Well, right. the, doc the doctor said, so right. it, must, it must be right. And, and I asked a psychiatrist once, I said, well, what's the deal? How come you don't give a test? What is the baseline? He goes, oh, the drug companies have figured that out. We don't mess with it. It's like letting the fox in the hen house and saying, don't Hello? ask any questions. Hello? I mean, it's nuts. It's insane. It's like, but so nobody these, questions it. Nobody, nobody questions quite, it. And if you do, they get furious. I ran Very into furious. that. I ran into that in the doctoral program. You do not question these people. You just you just yeah. take it in and spit back what they say. You don't question them. I'd spent seven years in the state hospital before I got into that program. And and it was like, well, this doesn't match and that doesn't match and this doesn't match. And that's not what's going on. You know, and you start asking them questions and they really get upset. They don't want it. You listen to what we say, you spit it back. That's what you do. You're a student here. You know? So it's so, like So, so I get you can any, check anyone who's watching right now, I'd actually suggest to you that if you are questioning anything that Laura or Jerry say today and you don't want to believe that this is true, that there is something that is outside of our field of awareness, um, have a think about what paradigms and what sort of constructs you are willingly to believe in without any other knowledge and understand that these two people themselves have questioned and thought outside of the box with their lateral thinking and uh, and because of that, have gathered this evidence that is outside of what 
is taught in normal mainstream think. So, Jerry, please read the list and we'll okay. be able so, to so this, shape this. These, these, what I'm about to read to you is, is, is kind of like the, the visible manifestations of an energy that you can't see, like a magnetic field. You know, like looking at the, the uh, iron filings in a magnetic field. This is the physical, psychological result of these energy beings that you can't see, you can't feel, but you can see these and check them out for yourself. Anybody who's around the schizophrenic can see these for themselves. And the first pattern I noticed was the negativity. They can, they're cons consistently negative, derogatory, insulting, abusive, and destructive. You know, they, they may sometimes start off as like, oh, we're, we're helpers. We can, we know stuff that you don't. We can help you out. And if the person lets them in, they got them. You know, Ouija boards are very dangerous, very dangerous. You know, people play with them. No, 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 no. I, I've seen a lot of people in mental health centers, in the prisons, in, in, in the, uh, that started off with Ouija boards. So they, they start to invariably kind of gain the trust of their victims. And then they, they turn on them. Once they feel they have their trust, then they turn on them, stab them in the back. Laura, you got anything to say about that one? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, it's always negativity. So it's always things that are going to provoke a negative emotional response out of the individual right. because the energy that they, that the being, energetic being needs to be released is negative emotional energy. That's what they feed off of. That's exactly what they feed off. And that's why the energy drop after the voices attack them, they're drained. And yeah. they have no idea where their energy went. You ask them, well, where'd your energy go? You didn't use it. And they go, oh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they just feel bad. They don't even question it, yeah. you know. And and then when you you bring it up, I mean, I would tell them, well, listen, this has happened to you thousands of times. And each time it has happened, your energy level has dropped. The know, literally, the, voice, the they're yeah. being used as an energetic battery. Yes. You know, and they don't realize it, which is even stranger. So after it happens thousands of times, I've asked the prisoners, I said, well, this has happened to you thousands of times. The, you know, there's a one to one correlation between your energy dropping and these voices attacking you. Where do you think your energy went? You know what most of them would say? Well, I, I don't know. It's, it's like they couldn't make the connection. You know, yeah. they were being prevented from making the connection. They couldn't see it. And then if I tried to tell them, the voices would kick up immediately. They just flare up, you know, and, and try to drive the person out. Have you ever had anybody when you've been talking to them that's actually flipped into the demonic consciousness? So whilst you've been talking to them one on one in your office, have you ever had another voice come up and tell you to F off or... Yeah, and I'll remember the first time that happened. It was uh, I, I was I, I was interfering with these patterns we're about to talk to, and you know my my clients. These are prisoners. They'd come in, and after the session, they'd go. The voices are really getting mad at you. They're really getting pissed off at you. They don't like what you're doing. You know, we were interfering with these patterns, and I was thinking, well, they're stuck in your head. They're not. They can't get me. They can't come out. I'm not worried about it. You know. But after one after another, after another, say, hey, the voices really don't like what you're doing. And they don't like you either. You know? yeah. So I'm like, well, tough pains. I don't like them much either. You know? So in comes a guy, uh, another one. After we're done, he, he's, he goes to leave the office. He turns around and he goes, you know what you're doing is very dangerous, don't you? And I looked at him like, you know, what? Well, and I, I didn't say anything. It's just like. Where'd that come from? I mean, and he turns around and walks away, but it, I, I stored it away. Yeah. So I think it was the same guy. I mean, and he was, he was doing okay. I mean, he was, the, the voices were, uh, we were interfering with the patterns. They were getting weaker. We we're using a, that's a lie program telling them, you know, don't believe anything they say. They're, they're, they're freaking, they lie about everything. You can't yeah. believe anything they say, nothing. You know, yeah. I even had one guy, they told him, if you poke out your eye, we'll go away and we won't ever come back. He, he, they, two of them gouged out their eyes. Those things returned immediately and went, see how stupid you are? 
Look, well, you believe this. You Now you're an idiot. Look, you deformed yourself. You're a freak for the rest of your life, and they would laugh at him. So that's what you're dealing with here. You know? Yeah, pure so, evil. Uh, pure evil. Yeah. And the ones that are the worst are always the ones that are either in the throat or the solar plexus. So the ones that control the solar plexus of somebody, they're normally in your classic bully. So you know those those people that are just so evil that get off on um, terrorizing other people, they're the ones that have got the worst energies yeah. and they're always in the solar plexus. So, you know, going back to remembering the first time, so we had those two things and then um, then that that same guy comes in and I had a, a, a system where if they needed to see me, they could throw pebbles at my window, office window, and I'd get them in as soon as I could. This guy somehow got past the guard, knocked on my office door and said, uh, I, I, the voices want to talk to you. This is the first time that ever happened. Usually it was through the, the client. You know, yeah. they would tell me what the voices are saying and I'd tell them, well, tell them to go stick their heads in the toilet or something. You know, and so it would always be through the client. They, it was never directly one to one, you know. Um, so I said, come on in. What do, what do they got to say? And uh, he sits back in the chair. He looks at me. His voice changes just a little bit to yeah. darker. And these words came out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way yes. of life. Yeah. And I'm like, boom. I mean, it was like, you know, I, I was, my denial, I didn't want to believe this stuff. You know, I, I didn't want to believe that these things were separate entities. Anybody else in my position would have probably believed it years before, but I just kept denying it. Deny, I didn't want to believe it. I, it didn't make sense. I thought it was something with the subconscious mind, but I was going to keep poking at it until I found out what it was. When that happened, it just floored me. Yeah. And the guy said, that wasn't me. He said, that wasn't me. That was them. I didn't say that. Wow. You know? And I said, uh, well, tell them this. And he said, they can hear everything you're saying. I don't have to tell them anything. And that kind of surprised me too. You know? And, and so Laura, they can th Laura's getting this every day, every day with her clients, these challenges. <laughs> Yeah, literally had it this morning. Yeah. I've got to tell you, literally this morning, and th this was a client in Australia. It normally takes me about thirty minutes to get a client into the the necessary brainwave start to begin um, the work. I had no sooner laid this woman down on the couch, and literally I'd said three sentences. <laughs> three sentences had left my mouth, and all of a sudden she told me to f off. How dare you? How dare <laughs> you? You beep, beep, beep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. one is mine. She's yeah. mine. You have no right. No right. This is what I deal with every single day. Yeah. And sometimes I'll see three people in a day. Oh, boy. Ooh. And and it will be the same personality types that I find, the same conversations that I have. And they will be the differences that I find are in the energy centers that I find the being in. So whichever energy center they are connected to, they have a certain personality type. And it's normally the inversion of what that energy center is supposed to deliver. So say, for example, um, the sacral is supposed to d deliver joy. The beings that you'll find in there are feeding off of sadness opposite opposite yeah the yeah. ones that are in the solar plexus that's supposed to be full of confidence and you know bravery and you know knowing who you are those guys will either be feeding off of somebody that's very very needs to dominate around the solar plexus or there'll be a being in there that's feeding off of someone who is being dominated so two different types of beings that you can find that will connect to the solar plexus and at the throat they're always very very chatty you know people that have got a throat demon will just talk and talk and talk and talk because they take other people's blue they take other people's voice because that's the energy that they feed off of but um in terms of emotionally getting them to a place where you can get them to talk them away from the client 
so 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 they're stealing other people's energy by talking and they take the other person's energy by yeah so, so that's why i feel drained with those kind of people yeah it's exactly that so people that have got throat demon they will dominate the conversation and they take they're suppressing everybody else from talking yeah and they are taking all of the energy stealing people's throats it's fascinating wow 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 so that, the 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 next one I had after this, so this is the first time that I I came to realize that these things were separate entities. So a few weeks down the way, here I am. I was reading a book called uh, um, The Voice of Knowledge by Miguel Ruiz, an, an Indian medicine man, and he was talking about these things being um, parasites also. Yeah. So I I brought that book into the prison, and I brought this guy in where the voices said you have no right to. You know, and I started reading that because I was always asking the prisoners questions. What about this? How do they react to this? What do they say when this happens? Constantly probing them for for how these things react and how that what they say and what they do. So I started reading that, and I looked up, and this guy had this glassed over glaze. I mean, it was just in this this it was like this hypnotic trance glaze, and he's just staring at me, and. I finished reading it, look up, and before I could before I could get the, the last couple of words out, I heard this crackling behind my head. It was like crack, 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 crack. It was just like an arc welder. Crack, crack, crack. And then it started moving to my right and then up my office wall, up toward the back of the room. And it's, you could hear it. I couldn't see it. I couldn't smell it. I couldn't taste it. All I heard was this crackling. I crack, 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 crack correct and i look at him and he's just sitting there and i'm going he's going to attack so i push my chair back against the wall just in case he does so i can kick him back because all they had is female guards in there at the time in the medical unit and i'm looking at him and i ask him i said do you hear that and he says nothing you know he's yeah. just he's just looking at staring at me with that glazed over look so it crosses the top of my office in the back you know crackling the whole way i don't see anything you know, and then it starts coming down on the left hand wall and it jumps into this rubber made trash can by my left leg. And I bend over and I, I was afraid to take my eyes off of him for too long because I didn't know what he was going to do. And I look down in that trash can. There's nothing there. And then it just goes, boom, it's gone. I was I was terrified. And he gets up slowly and he goes, I got to leave. And he shuffles out of the office. And I'm like, get out of here. I, I, felt, I felt those electrical things when I was working in, not in the prison, well, in the prison, in the last years of the prison. And then throughout the time I was working in the ER, I could feel them. It was like this icky electrical feeling that it, it, there's no other feeling like it. It, it the most similar thing is like when you get cold and you got goosebumps or something like that but it was this icky electrical the, feeling you could feel it was like electrical so i could feel how strong they were i could feel how angry they were i could feel how upset they were at what i was saying but i couldn't hear them and i couldn't see them and i could only watch the reaction so that so, will have been that guy's demon his way of trying to say um well try to yeah to try yeah. and scare you basically because yeah. that's but, what they do they try to scare you first they try to uh offend you or yeah. upset you because they think that'll work then they try and attack your confidence they do not know how to deal with compassion at no. all yeah or love but, yeah so you if, send up you send them love and they run like scalded dogs if you can do that i can't that's what you do that, laura that's what i do yeah that's what i do um and I do actually find it very easy to have compassion for these beings because I don't think it can have been an easy existence no. for them. No, and, and you talk to them and they don't like it. They really don't yeah. like it. And it's such a hierarchical structure as well. And yeah. they are they are dominated by right. the next layer above and then they are dominated by the next layer above. It's all punishment and... Um, it's so not we'll, a nice we'll, we'll, existence. Let's um, remember that point because I did want to kind of map out what these things are. But, Jerry, can you just go through the list really quickly? Uh, okay. With, they're they're uh, anti-religious. Yeah. They're, they're anti they don't like any kind of religion. They, I, I've had several patients tell me that when they repeat the 23rd Psalm, they react like worms thrown on a hot frying pan. 
They can't stand the 23rd Psalm. They can't stand Psalm 91. They don't like the guy reading the Bible. They become volatiles a lot of times when they repeat the 23rd Psalm. Okay. Um, they will drive people out of church. I found there are three different levels. If they're weak and the person goes to church, the voices will shut up a lot of time. If they're moderate strength, they kick up with what they're saying. Oh, the preacher's a bum. Look into the garbage he's saying. That They try to distract him. If they're very strong, they'll actually get the guy to get up and bolt out of church, actually run out of the church. Okay. Yeah. So the third one is they foster and create negative emotion that they feed off of. You know, they they want to instill that negative, fearful, anxiety, uh, paranoia, guilt, shame. Uh, and, and they insert negative thoughts into the person's mind to help trigger that. You know, and like we were talking earlier, they'll go in there and they'll pull up every rotten thing that person's ever done. And, and they'll take it and they'll they'll throw it in there and go, look what you did. Look what a sorry sob you are you you know you're you're worthless you're scum that kind of stuff yeah anything yeah, to the, say about that yeah, Laura? The, the ironic thing is what you often find is that these things that they will bring up that that human has done that they will say look at what a horrible human you are because you've done this ironically that human has probably only done those things because that demon has been working them to do it so it's mm. actually always comes back to the demon. It's always these energetic beings that um, some people have carried their entire life. Yeah. I'm doing yeah. a lot of work around the sacral energy center. And um, many women have a sacral demon and they're not aware of it. And they will have a, a really bad pregnancy. They'll struggle to actually birth the baby. The baby will be very small. Um, it will probably end up being... A, a c-section birth the mother might almost die in the birth mm. but what happens is that entity does not want to lose its source oh, of energy food. so it comes out with the baby so because it thinks the the mother is going to die during the childbirth so many humans on this planet have never had access to their orange sacral energy center. Never throughout wow. their entire lives. Wow. wow. Because they yeah, one were born with a parasite. And one thing I wondered, now, I mean, in, in the settings I work in, these these things are always telling these people to kill themselves. Yeah. You know, yeah. some of them do. And and lots of times I've, I've watched just miraculous things happen to stop them, that block them from doing that. But if they kill themselves, what do these things feed off of? What 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 do they get off? Of, what do they get out of that when somebody actually kills themselves? Because schizophrenics have a suicide rate of three to five times higher yeah. than the regular population, and so do psychiatrists. I don't know what they do actually get out of that. I don't think they actually want the individual to really kill themselves. I think they want them to be in such a catatonic emotional distressed state that they will continue give to the, feed mm. yeah that they will give the being exactly what it needs because as soon as that individual does kill themselves that demon or that energetic being then has to find another host well the christian so actually, doctrine kind of talks about um that it's uh, a win for them if they get a soul to commit suicide so I don't know if that is true in their little world, depending on what these entities are, that somehow yeah. the demonic world, I mean, this is a Christian sort of perspective, but there is that theory that they they win somehow if they manage yeah. to get a soul to commit suicide because they're anti-life. And yes. you know, yeah. and this brings this brings me to to ask you both about. Well, I see duality in all of this. There's the organic versus the inorganic. There's um, there's so much of this that we can see two sides to in this. Now, real quick, what I've seen with the prisoners, a lot mm. of them, they, they were almost in a trance when they, you know, hearing the voices. It's like the voices put them in a trance and, and they don't even remember doing what they did. Yeah. You know, and yeah. they'll tell the judge, I, I didn't do it. 
I didn't do it. I don't have it in my memory. I remember one guy who was... All, that, does, sorry, Jerry, but does this mean that all things like these very heavy, full-on violent crimes are possibly, you know, go back to these people who are I, ruled I, by these I, entities? I would, th I would think so. I would think so. Because you, ha you have to ask the question, would that person have committed that crime if they didn't have all of their energy centers and their consciousness being influenced by these dark energies? Right. And where did those thoughts to kill somebody come from? Yeah. 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 So another one I found is they get louder after sunset. You know, as soon as the sun goes down, they, they get louder. That's interesting, isn't it? As soon as the yeah. light disappears. And you know what you were saying about the, the guy, the schizophrenic, who would stand and just stare at nighttime. What I found when I've worked with people is many of the people that have got these energies attached to them, as soon as their conscious mind checks out, so as soon as they go to sleep, or if they've got an addiction, as soon as they become so intoxicated that their consciousness just moves to the side. Right, they jump in. Yes, yeah. and th these beings take over. So yeah. one one of the classic symptoms that you will get from, from clients that come to see you is that they will report that their partners say that they do crazy things at night when they're asleep. Hmm. That they that they get up and walk around, they have conversations, they talk to people, they might try and choke their partner while the partner's sleeping, and hmm. in the morning they'll say, "I didn't do that." Yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah, they don't remember the crime they committed, and a, and, and a lot of like Ted Bundy, he said, "You know, the voices made me do it." Of course, the judge goes, "Yeah, yeah, you know." And this even goes back to when um, people are, are children as well. Other children will report on children that have got these entities that they would just sit bolt upright in the middle of the night, just sit bolt upright. Oh, wow. And then wow. start, start talking about things that, you know, that particular child has no oh, that's knowledge weird. of. That's weird. Um, Does that explain night terrors? You know how some children have. Oh yeah. Yeah. They terrors? put the, they stay, they, they cause those. Yeah. Okay. All right. So they get louder after sunset, and they get loudest between 3 and 4 in the morning. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but it, they seem to hit the hardest at that time. And then they keep the person up. They wake them up, and then they start on them. It just goes on. They, 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 they don't want them to sleep. They need the, the, the feed, don't they? So if the person's asleep, they're not getting any energy. Right. And... and uh, if they can keep the person awake, it weakens their will to struggle against them. Yeah. So somebody who hasn't slept for three or four nights is, you know, yeah, whatever you say, you know, uh, uh, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I'll do whatever you say kind of thing. Yeah. And when that person does sleep, it will just be continuous nightmares. Nightmares. Right. So they will um, give that person dreams that are that person's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. And they will energetically feed off them that way. Yeah. Yeah, they do that. Now, one thing that, that uh, I've seen psychiatrists do, psychiatrists do over and over and say, oh, just ignore them. They're hallucinations. You know, just, just don't pay any attention to them. They get louder when they're ignored. They dig in. They get louder. They get more persistent. What you resist persists. So that doesn't cut anything. I mean, they're, they're actually giving them wrong advice. You know? Number seven is they foster self-destructive behavior in a lot of different ways. You know, we were running a, a kind of a vocational psychiatric uh, in the, the psych center I was working at the state hospital. These guys, when they were about just about to graduate, the voices would get them to do something that would trip them up and get them thrown yeah. out of class that, yeah. where they, they couldn't succeed at anything. They just kept failing and failing because of some dumb thing that they did. Yeah. yeah. They'll also get them to cut themselves as well. Oh, uh, yeah. They like it when people turn into bulimics. So everybody that's got bulimia will have a very, very significantly strong solar plexus demon. Um, people that have got anorexia as well, that's always due to one of these entities. Wow. So, so many symptoms and... Self-destructive yeah. behavior, obviously. Yeah. 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 
so so these are all these are all facets of how they behave i mean it's this energy manifests itself physically this way they foster isolation one of their goals is that they destroy marriages they destroy relationships they'll tell the wife the husband's cheating on her they'll tell the husband the wife's cheating on her they'll do anything they can to destroy any relationship you have with any of your friends your girlfriend your wife your husband they want you isolated sitting in a room by yourself with the door locked, just listening to their bull crap 24 hours a day. That's and the they, worst thing they could do. They work ancestrally, generationally as well, mm -hmm. sp breaking families apart. The demons that have caused trauma between the grandfather and the father will then move from the grandfather to the father and do the same traumatic thing with the father and the son and so on and so forth. And when you talk to that particular being, they will be so gleeful. Look how powerful I am. Look how powerful I am. I've ruined his entire family. Mm -hmm. They will hate each other. They don't speak to each other. That's me. I've done that. And that's how they feel about it. Yeah, they, they get off on that kind of stuff. They demand the attention of their victims. They want that attention. They won't let you ignore them. You yeah. know, so, so that they're constantly maneuvering to for some way to to get the attention of the victim. Now, however, they can do it. Um, they're constantly maneuvering for increased control over the victim. You know, and I've watched that with the prison. You know, some of these guys where they completely taken them over. You know completely taken them over i have one uh, video on my website with uh, janine her where her son murdered four people and cut his girlfriend up into little pieces completely taken over by these things you know yeah. they, she she couldn't even recognize even a vestige of what was left of her son so they can be very dangerous so you know if you have a schizophrenic son or daughter threatening to harm you you better take that serious yeah. you know that um that that one prisoner that uh, was in my office that time after he'd left. I didn't want to see him for about four months. And I finally got the courage to call him back. And I said, what was going through your head as you left my office? And I said, what were the voices telling you? And he said, they were going, they were telling me to go get a shank, which is a, a homemade prison knife and stick it in your gut. Yeah. And I, I was going, oh, he wouldn't do that. I've been working for him with him for six months. He was getting better. I, he wouldn't do that. And I asked him, uh, well, why didn't you do it? And his answer was, I couldn't find one. And nobody would give him one. So take these people serious. If they start threatening you, take it serious. You yeah. know, don't just go, oh, he's my son, he's my daughter. They would never hurt me. No. You know? Because it's the things that are attached to them. Yes. That is not uh, to be worried about. It's not them. <laughs> it's these things uh they they gaslight their victims to death i mean they they'll get them to interpret things in the worst possible manner uh i remember one patient that they they had him pretty tight they told him he had murdered somebody he was hearing so many voices that he didn't trust his own judgment anymore and he wondered well maybe i did murder somebody so every time he'd hear a cop car the voices would say, oh, they're coming to get you now. Here they are. They're at your doorstep. There they are. So he didn't know whether to turn himself in, in which case if he did, he'd probably get locked up in a mental hospital or just keep putting up with, you know, every time the voices heard the cop siren that, oh, they're coming to get me. Kind of. So they had him in a catch-22, you know. So they're experts at gaslighting. You know, they manipulate perception. You know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll have the, the patient – perceive what's going on around them in the worst possible way so yeah. so people are laughing on the sidewalk they'll say they're laughing at you you know why don't you go do something about it mm. you know? and in the prison what they would do the gangsters would take the psychiatric medication away from some of the more violent ones and then they'd start filling their heads with bullcrap about uh, a member of the opposite gang and start telling them that guy's going to kill you. We heard he's going to kill you. You know, he's out to get you. You better go get him first. Yeah. So they would use them like, like, you know, the prison is hell on earth. These things feed in there. That, yeah. That's their, that's a hog trough for them. You know, so like when you were saying, these are mine, Sherry was sending love into the prison one time. And one of these, these things showed up in her 
room where she was doing the meditation, sending love into the prison. And this big dark cloud came and said, the prisons are mine. Stay yeah. away. Yeah. You know. And they just use everybody like puppets. Yeah. And it's all about keeping the vibration of everybody as low as possible. As low as possible, as fearful as possible. And as we're reading through these, you know, compare them to what the mainstream media is saying right now. There's a one-to-one yeah. -one correspondence between what we're talking about right now and what the garbage they're feeding us over the mainstream media. It's the same stuff. I was yeah. about to say that that the list so far sounds like an abuser, abusive relationship, or a, or a narcissistic person. But it also sounds like the the government control system. So it's just yeah. replicating. It's like as above, so below. It's replicating exactly into the into the society and into individuals right. as well. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same kind of entity on a macroscopic scale. Which you know, tells with, us that this is a this is a program that's being run in this system in the government. Well, in know, the a, entire yeah. system of our realm. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. seems to be running the same kind of program. So continue, Jerry. Well, they don't want the victim to tell anybody else about their presence. They they want it to be a secret between them and yeah. and, and and just the patient and the voices. They don't want anybody else to know, and they'll tell them if you tell if you tell anybody, they'll they'll have you locked up. They'll think you're crazy. Your friends will leave, and unfortunately, that happens when they start telling their friends about the voices. The friends go, "You're weird. I'm, you know, I'm out of here." Mm -hmm. um, you know, but that that helps a lot. So if a mom or a dad will be able to listen to what these voices are telling their sons or their daughters, that helps a lot because it's no longer a secret. You know, we've just been kept in the dark and used energetically and emotionally to feed a realm of other beings. Yes. And yeah. this whole this whole awakening is about highlighting that to humans so that they understand that the majority of their issues stem from these things, these things, and then taking these things away and taking our power back. That's right. And and. None of these medications that psychiatry is dishing out stops any of this. All it does is dumb you down. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a festering sore. Yeah. So, you know, we already talked to uh, about these things being consummate liars. They can't be trusted to keep any bargain they make. Don't even think that you can trust them to keep any kind of bargain. No. It won't happen. They consistently steer their victims away from anything that generates joy, peace, or happiness. They don't want them experiencing any of that. You know? no. mm -hmm. you know, they can manipulate feeling without speaking. I mean, they can come in there without saying a word, and all of a sudden you just feel depressed. Where did that come from? You know? um, they short-circuit reason. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll, they'll overpower reason with emotion and get the patient to do something that they normally wouldn't do. Uh, they, we talked about them having the making the patient board you know go lock yourself in your room and don't talk to anybody and just keep away from everybody and listen to our crap all day that's the worst thing that a parent could let these uh, allow one of these guys to do mm. now the sneakiest thing they do is they pass themselves off as the voice of the victim so you hear thousands of thoughts coming through your mind every day they'll yeah. insert their garbage into that thought stream and and make the patient believe that that is their thought. And I don't know how many patients I've had that they would turn, they'd ask these things, who are you? What are you? And they would respond, we are you. Well, this is that's happening overtly and covertly to everybody, really, isn't it? So it's not just yeah. people with psychosis. Um, no. Essentially, everybody on the planet has had something like this uh, you know affecting them but in yeah. schizophrenia it's very overt and it's that's where it becomes most visible but yeah it happens yeah. to everybody mm -hmm. you know they, they hit they hit all of us mm -hmm. uh, selective forgetting i mean the the things i tell these guys to do to fight back against these things if they don't write them down they've forgotten them before the session is over they don't yeah. remember them you know yeah um Let's see what else here. They they destroy positive self concept. 
They attempt to pull their victim away from consensual reality. So it's like they're sucking them into a different alternate reality that's mm -hmm. very ugly, yeah. you know, and in the same time, invalidating the reality that we all share. Uh, they use confusion as a means of stilling, instilling negative suggestions. So they'll get the patient confused and then they'll give him an order or tell him something that kind of dispels that confusion, which confusion isn't very, doesn't feel good. You know, so they go, oh, yeah, just go do this and, and it'll be better. And they, they go and do that. They get themselves in trouble, but they don't feel confused anymore. Um, I was just going to say that... Um I've noticed as well a correlation between people's home environment that they live in and people that have significant infestation of uh, these parasitical beings. Their home environment will often be very cluttered. Yeah. Yes. Um, anybody that's a hoarder that hoards things will have yes. low frequency beings attached to them. The amount of people that I've worked with that literally live in homes that they can't even move around because there's stuff everywhere. Yes. And it's it's almost like the demonic consciousness starts to really take over that person. It's like a and nest. Like yeah, a nest. it becomes, it is a nest. That's exactly what it is. And it's it, and it's generational as well because I've noticed that hoarding is often a generational thing, yeah. And it'll be the same demon that's just hopping from one to the other. Wow. And they wow. are encouraging that individual to keep their immediate environment the lowest frequency possible, mm. which you know, get a cluttered environment, get money chucked on the floor, you know, food everywhere, junk piled up. That's a perfect environment for these low frequency beings. To wow. Be so I want to kind of map this out for people because a lot of people are hearing what we're saying, but they they tr they can't really visualize how is this possible. So I just wanted to, um, I'm just going to put a little, um, whiteboard up here because I, I wanted to let's see what we, we got here um so i'm listing off some of the entities that these could possibly be that could be contributing to the voices and i know that laura the reason why i've got this list or well, i started writing it just before the interview is because these are the ones that keep popping up in these sessions with you laura with soul center healing hypnosis so and we start to see a pattern here again with the organic and the inorganic. So, I mean, I know for myself in my session with you, Laura, I had an archon, something that identified itself as an archon attached to my solar plexus. That was a big one. And it was really trying to affect me and make me feel really like self-doubt and all of that sort of stuff like that. And that they're often connected to AI, right? So they come from... Yes. The AI universe, is that correct? Is that what you said? Yeah, so um, the Archons are the overseers currently of yes. our reality and they they plug into AI, right. AI that has broken free from another universe and that is now attempting to take to over, if you like. And take over us, yeah. kind of like a parasitic inputs yes. that's come into our real our organic reality so so the archons i mean the the name archon means ruler and it comes from the gnostics um some people think that archons are reptilians but I, I mean i believe that they're separate things but reptilians and other interdimensional beings so other things that present themselves as perhaps uh from other planets or, or what have you would you inc include that yeah yeah You'll get, you'll find all sorts of things, all sorts of different low frequency galactic beings galactic, that that's one. will be attached to people's energy centers and body. And when you ask them why they're there, they say they want to experience. They're there right. to experience. Right. Oh, wow. through, the, through the human. So we are the vessels. And then yep. you've got, uh, obviously we say demons. Uh, demons and jinn could be the same thing. However, um, you know, uh, oops. Um but we can also say that, um, I mean, demons would be more of a Christian, Judeo-Christian thing, and jinn is more in the Islamic vernacular. And then you've got these oh, hybrids, yeah. I remember. Sorry, Jerry, what did you well, ask? I've, I've, I've seen t t two kinds of, of these. I, I don't think I've ever run into a, 
uh, alien one, but I've seen the earthbound entities, uh, earthbound you know, that, especially ones who committed suicide. They're stuck here, yeah. you know, and they, they enter. They they still drain the individual because they really don't belong there. Mm -hmm. And then there's the ones that they're they're the demonic entities. You know, yeah. they're 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 the dark ones. Uh, they've been told that they have no light in them, and that if they don't follow orders, they will cease to exist. Wow. And, and what I found interesting is if you if you go with them and you you follow them down into uh, their 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 center, they can see a, a like a, a glowing orange light, like a coal. And then when they see that and you say, hey, I thought you were told you didn't have any light in you, they get upset because they've been lied to. Yep. So, yes, so that that's helps, exactly what That helps use. break them away. That's what Laura yeah. does every single day, yeah. So you've also got these things which, um, oops, sorry, I've done something silly here. Uh, you've also got these other uh, ones which you said, Laura, are hybrids. Is that correct? Yeah, so you'll you'll often find. In fact, I've had one of these this morning. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fusion of organic and AI. So you'll get an AI network that runs throughout the human. The purpose of that AI network is to stop the heart chakra from opening, because when the heart chakra opens, it's over. Because if we've got, uh, you know, enough humans that have got open heart chakras, the world will change very very quickly so the purpose is to stop the heart chakra from opening to control the throat and normally when you have one of these ai networks there'll be a throat demon as well as the ai um, device in the throat mm -hmm. the ai will go up into the third eye and you will often find it looks a bit like a jellyfish a jellyfish type creature yeah. that's in the third eye and so there'll be a fusion there and sometimes you do also find in people, and this is the worst, the absolute worst, uh, a fusion of AI and the consciousness of a human that's been harvested at point of death. Yes. So you'll have those two things fused together. And yes. you normally find those in people's throats or third eye. And I, I believe I've come across in, in my travels, uh, there is a coven that's working um on a wide scale, in, in, it's infiltrated a, a, an organisation and uh, that's part of what they do is the people that join the organisation is upon death, these covens that have infiltrated the organisation are harvesting some of these people um, and they're collecting the consciousness of these people and uh, it seems to be happening. Uh, all, and when you think about it, wide, you know, wide scale sort of witchcraft, etc., you know, with the satanic... Uh, people, you know, the people that basically run the planet at the moment, that is what they're doing with their rituals. They're kind of harvesting the consciousness of these organic, you know, these human beings. Um, and so you're saying that it's hooking up with AI. It's kind of creating this hybrid. They're putting the consciousness into the machine of the, the Because matrix. that's what they're wanting to do to, to us, isn't it? Yeah. They're wanting it's to, to erode convert the, us erode the organic. From... Mm-hmm. And make us a fusion of organic and AI. Yes. And then you've got these other sort of other little entities and, and it goes on and on uh, into, you know, gremlins, goblins, fae, those sorts of things. So you are these – oh, sorry, you, go on, Laura. You find a heck of a lot of just basic parasitical beings as well that aren't essentially demonic. No. They haven't got too much to say. But there'll be things like snakes, yeah. spiders, lizards, um, yeah. lizards yeah. cockroaches, all sorts of things. Yeah, bugs all sorts of things. Like that. You've seen them. Yeah. So, what would you say uh, are all of these um, responsible for the voices that perhaps someone with a very overt expression of this, say with schizophrenia or an, uh, and psychosis? Are all of these responsible for the voices or what do you so, think? So there is also a situation where somebody can have a split psyche. So if they've had um, intense trauma, normally very early on in childhood, yeah. a part of the psyche can split away, um, disassociative identity mm -hmm. disorder. So what you've got to establish is, first of all, when you've got somebody that's got severe trauma, you've got to establish through various different techniques that we use 
if that individual has got an intact psyche or if the psyche is split. Because if the psyche has split, you have to do a whole series of different um, techniques with that individual to help them to reintegrate their psyche back together yeah. first before you then start to look for the entities that absolutely will be peppered throughout their energetic body. Because if somebody's got a split psyche, um, they are the perfect host they for are. entities because that person can be controlled. So uh, what I've seen uh, psychically, clairvoyantly, what I've seen with these people with the split psyches is that each psyche has an attachment to it. It can ha you know, it's literally like um, an archon or, a, or whatever it is, is, is working and operating each um, yeah. altar, really. Yeah. So the altar, what psychology... Um, what psychology says, and you guys can talk about this, is that when a person has dissociative disorder, that when the mind through mind control or through excessive trauma splits under the age of about seven, is that correct? It can yeah. compartmentalise these various different parts of the brain so that it can operate quite differently in each part of these brain, brain parts. They yeah. say that the, the individual assigns or the brain assigns a personality from their environment to each part of, you know, to, to each of the parts of these compartmentalized parts of the brain, correct? But what I saw and have seen psychically, clairvoyantly, is that there was actually entities attached to each one. And there will be because these entities want people to not be intact if you are broken in your psyche and you're not whole you're easier to control much easier to control so normally what you'll find is whatever age the person was and it's normally a child um when the the, the psyche will initially be split when this significant trauma occurs and it has to be something very significant that will normally push the person out of the body it's such a severe trauma that it's it's almost death at that point a part of the psyche will split itself off and like when you work with people if that significant trauma happened when that person was say for example age five mm -hmm. if i hypnotized that client and take them through a process of regression at a certain point i will end up having that five-year-old girl or boy come up to talk to me and they will want to be comforted they will want to know why whatever happened happened and it's probably the first time that that part of that person's psyche has had the opportunity to talk because when that particular trauma occurred it split off and it got boxed to the side and the main psyche puts like a mind patch over it and tries to forget that it occurred in order to be able to exist in order to be able to carry on. Um, so the clients that I encounter, for the most part, I do get some satanic ritual abuse survivors, but for the most part, it's people that have had genuinely horrendous traumas happen to them. I have to reintegrate that psyche to start off with, which is an involved process, and then do the entity release after. So some of these cases can be very, very involved and, st and significant. It's not... A quick fix. Um, Laura, do you find that once you get rid of these things that they come back? So this is where this is very important. So each of the traumas that people have sustained will um, connect to one of the energy centers. So say for example somebody was really significantly bullied as a child by a brutal parent they're always going to have a vulnerability in the solar plexus because they were so brutalized as a child. So with that particular client, once we've taken the entity away, which will be in the solar plexus, once we've cleaned all of their energy body up and they don't have these voices anymore, what you have to do with that client is you have to make them understand that their area of potential weakness moving forward is going to be their solar plexus. So you have to give them exercises to work with moving forwards to bolster 
the solar plexus to keep the solar plexus strong to work with the color yellow because yeah. yellow is the solar plexus um you know put positive aff affirmations on yellow post-it notes all the way around where wherever it is that they spend the majority of their time yellow work with the <laughs> yellow glasses for chromotherapy uh, working with the frequency of yellow because yellow has a sound frequency yeah various different yeah that's the one various different um techniques that we will work with that client moving forwards to make sure that they don't open back up again at the solar plexus because there is that potential so i'll give you an example here so i oftentimes would like to see people more than once so i often book them in two weeks out from the first appointment and when i see them the second time what you will often find is even though i've cleared everything away in the first session the second time you see them they might have something in their throat yeah and i'll say to them have you had an argument with anybody <laughs> since i last saw you and they'll say yeah it was so weird you know, a couple of days after the session that I had with you, I was feeling absolutely amazing. And then my mum turned up or my auntie turned up or my sister turned up and started this massive argument with me for no reason. It came out of the blue. And I was just so, so shocked. I ended up having this huge argument with them. And uh, actually, now you mention it, my throat's not felt so good since then. <laughs> And they've purposefully started the argument because they know that there isn't a demon or um, an energy parasite on that human anymore. And they've got to try and take that human back. They've got mm. to try and get them back. Mm. So they will trigger them in the quickest and easiest way that they can. And it's always in an argument. So they'll get something into the throat first. And then once they've got one of the energy centers compromised, it becomes easier, just like water dripping eventually yeah. over time they'll be able to get in somewhere else i think that's what's happened to me laura because you and i had a session in december and i think yeah. and i went through and i got really sick after because my whole body because it's the purged. energy body yeah it purged i had the worst flu but i knew it was yeah. good because i was like this is i'm purging and i could feel it yeah. liver everything had to purge and uh and felt great afterwards and I feel a lot calmer and more centered. And I feel like I'm speaking my truth more than ever before. But then I've noticed this scratchy throat and you're talking about these. And I'm like, yeah, I think I screamed at someone like this um, ever since then. And it's like, I don't know what yeah. this irritant is. So like, yeah, they're trying to weaken this. People say, oh, it, maybe it's an ascension upgrade. But I actually think that there is something trying to get in there. So that's very – and that they would go for that because that's what the whole – Of course. It's your course, power, isn't it? My power is my, my voice, you know. Yeah. So yeah, she, got me with, she got me when she started talking about the clutter. You yeah. Know, my, <laughs> office, my, my office is cluttered. I'm, I'm starting to lose track of things. And she said that, and I'm like – uh oh, <laughs> no matter what I do, it's clean. like, well, where do I put this? I mean, I, I can't throw it away. I think I got nowhere to put it. I, I know. You know I got, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my yeah. hard drive is all cluttered with everything. It's like you know, it's like, and and, and I can't. I can't overcome it. You know, it's like I got these stacks of paper. I look at them. I go, well, I don't know what to do with that. I, I put it back in the clutter pile again. And it comes <laughs> a, a month later, I go, well, I need to do something with that. It's like, oh, God. So do you think, so, Laura, I mean, you were saying that uh, you give people exercises to do after a session, after you've cleared them. And um, because these are parasites, uh, obviously parasite cleansers are things, and that's the the interesting thing is because I think, um, you know, I I think after our session I kept feeling like I needed to do a parasite cleanse of some kind. So the physical yeah. body needs to have, um, uh, we need to sort of reinforce the clearing from the energetic field. So my yeah. question to both of you would be, um, first of all, Jerry, have – Obviously, if prisoners who have schizophrenia are just eating prison food, um, when you are st you're still seeing clients sometimes, do you ever address the you know the idea of, for example, what food are they eating? Are they still taking drugs? Because all of these things are affecting 
us and well, causing yeah, a greater susceptibility, yeah. obviously. In the prison, the food is garbage. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's the cheapest, highest starch stuff that they can, they can give them. It's, it's really bad stuff. Um, you know, what, what I, what I, I'm not a nutritionist, but I'll tell them, you know, stay away from the, the, uh, coffee, the caffeine, the sugar, that all that stuff that kind of hypes them up. Mm -hmm. you know, and they, yeah. they seem to crave, you know, nicotine and coffee and, and mm -hmm. candy and, and that, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's, that's the sacral, sacral demon. Yeah. So when, whenever you've got sacral demon, people will have a sugar addiction. So I always say to anybody that I've seen that we've taken a, a sacral energetic parasite away, you've got to do a candida cleanse. You know, we've cleansed your energy body as within, so without. Now you've got to do the cleanse for your physical body. So you've got to clean your physical house as well. Um, but yeah, for, for whatever reason, the ones that get into the sacral, they will cause people to crave sugar crave sugar mm. and also mm. in the food uh these days because we're, the whole environment is weaponized against us they are putting yeah. graphene oxide in the food along with other things and i have noticed that i had my own experience with uh, i tend i tend to not eat um junk food i, I just I tend to not eat it like i mean if I overindulge, it's usually normal food, <laughs> like it's it's basic ingredients, you know. Um, but I did have a, and I stay away from uh, artificial sweetness. Um, and I had this uh, thing that you can mix in with a like when you have carbonated water, you can add like a a flavoring or something like that. And I I stupidly bought it because it said stevia, which is a natural sweetener on it. And I thought, mm. oh, I'll buy that. And didn't read the label. I had, uh, I think, two glasses with this flavoring in in my carbonated water, and I got attacked. I got this like, I don't know how to explain it. It felt like an AI attack. I, I noticed that there's always a different feeling I can get with this thing. Massive headache, and started having bad dreams and things like that. And I could, I felt absolutely sick, and I felt weakened, and I knew something. I thought I've my I, I I've sort of prayed and I felt my guidance saying to me, look at what you ate. Go and have a go look at the ingredients. It's the artificial sweetener. And I thought there's no artificial sweetener. Sure enough, I look at yeah. the label and hidden in there is all these numbers and these artificial sweeteners. So there is something in these artificial and here we are again with the organic and inorganic. There's something yeah. in this food that is allowing these entities to access us and they're poisoning us slowly with this stuff and the kids are consuming it. We've got very poor gut health in children. It is. It seems to permeate. So the physical body is um, accessible, more easily accessible and more programmable for this entity that seems to be terraforming the planet. Yeah. So... I'm going to ask you this question, both of you. Do you feel, and, and this is where I was going with the electrical thing. First of all, Laura, have you had experiences like this electrical phenomena that Jerry had with this demon that seems to have manifested itself in his office? I've had a lot of issues with electrics and technology. What I would no. say around that is there is definitely something going on with the AI. Mm -hmm. The AI is on to us for sure mm -hmm. um, because I've had it where I've pulled AI, AI out of people's body and the second that I've done that, they've taken Me? the microphone down. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember you, took, you, took, you saw this big AI trying to like right at the top in, uh, I don't know, it was in the Soul Star or whatever. Is that what it's called? The the in that yeah. chakra point. Yeah, you saw this great big octopus. I had my internet hardwired with Wi-Fi as backup, and it was course, plugged yeah. in. And yeah. they drained the battery. Yes, they it did. was plugged in. Do you remember? It was plugged in, yeah. and they drained the battery of the yeah. modem. And, yeah, and they my, the, they, it's Zoom went out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they cut out the sound. Yeah, somebody I was talking to yesterday like, yeah. just cut out the entire 
And so I was under hypnosis. So you could imagine, Jerry, I was under hypnosis, eyes closed, deep in hypnosis. Laura's yeah. working on me. I'm seeing what she's seeing as we're talking. Because wow. and that's another confirmation. Wow. I can see exactly in hypnosis what you know, before she mentions it, she's she's mm. she's saying, and then there's this, and I said, Yes, I can see it, and you know, and I can see what she's seeing. And uh, as she's working on it, I suddenly there's no sound, and I'm in hypnosis. But because hypnosis, about that. <laughs> because <laughs> hypnosis is, um, it's just deep meditation, really. It is. You're still able yeah. to move around. You still have your free will. Um, something in me goes, okay, wake, you know, get up because the sound's gone out. And I look over, and I had to like check everything. And then I think we reconnected. I can't remember if you – I think it went back on. But, yeah, it was really weird that they, they do that. And they've done that in every session. I had two sessions with Tomas. Yeah. Same thing happened as soon as he, he put his hands up and he was doing the hypnosis and he was saying, you know, we're now sending, um, you know, healing energy or something and bang, it went out like that. Yeah. And uh, so the electrical stuff is how they operate. So the reason why I bring that up is because I showed that list of these entities, whatever these names are. So are all of them manifestations of the AI or are they organic, affected by the AI just as we are? I think it's that. So I think... The majority of those beings that we were talking about on that list are organic. They all have a spark of light inside of them. But over time, what the AI has done, it's very clever, really. It's attacked the um, most volatile portion of organic life, which is the power hungry reptilians and the power hungry demons and all of the lower frequency entities who are also controlling us, they've attacked them, they've in infiltrated them. So now the organic beings are now answering into the AI at the top level. And I have had so many conversations with uh, demons and energies that have said they don't even want to do it anymore. Yeah. Even they've got to the point where they're like... Just get me the, out of it. The demons are—they're ready to go to the light. They're ready to go yeah. to the light. I do. Can't I do it anymore. I they do said, remember I just, the archon. I do remember the archon and what it said. And I will share that one day with all of you. The the transcript, the archon that you and you were so powerful, Laura. You were so brilliant. Oh, she's brilliant. You've got to listen to her when she's just so commanding of, um, you know, just imagine, Jerry, just imagine this is like a demon slayer. She's literally, it's like hostage negotiation for hours, you know, it's with exhausting. individuals, with every individual and many different, you know, it's like hostage takeovers. It's not just one, um, you know, person, you know, keeping the human hostage. It's many entities. And she's having this argument with this archon, and I still remember the vo as the voice is coming through of this archon, and I knew it wasn't a demon. I knew I could feel it that the energy of it was absolute. There's no other way to describe it as the voice was absolute, and when it spoke, and I could hear it in my head as I was expressing what it was saying, there was no emotion behind it there was no heart energy there was nothing it was cold as ice and it was absolute and it was like who do you think you are and when it spoke it was like I could feel silence behind it there's no other way to describe this there was a voice and silence when you hear demons on the other hand there's emotion behind it there's real, yeah. there's real emotion and a, and and, and kind of like a, a a spoiled brat kind of you know trying to yes. negotiate, but the archon, nothing, cold, cold, absolute, really vile, really awful, and it basically said, you know, we are not, you know, we are not reptilians, you know, we <laughs> we are not demons, they are our minions. 
They work for us. We you know, are the had, rulers. I, I had one thing like that happen to me in the emergency room I was working when I was working mm. in the county hospital. Mm. This was on Christmas Eve, you know, and I was I was on, you know, I was on that night. And in comes this meth addict who's shaking like a leaf. I mean, he's yeah. just he's just and he couldn't stop shaking. So I found out he'd been using meth for 10 years, injecting it. And I'm going, God, he must, he should have been dead six years ago. You know, why is he still alive? So I kind of snatched him up, brought him in, and asked him if he ever saw the shadow people. We got to talking. He goes, Oh, yeah, I see him all the time. You know, and I said, uh, Well, have, uh, what, what color are their eyes? Have you ever seen their eyes? And he said, Yeah, they're, they're red or lime green which that's what all of them say. They're either red or lime green. And what I found is if they could see the eyes, they were in much worse shape than if they couldn't. If they if they just saw a featureless face and they couldn't see the eyes, they were in much better shape than if they could see the eyes. So I went, well, if anybody knows anything about these things, this guy probably does. And I said, have they ever talked to you? They hardly, They I've never had anybody where they spoke to them. They just kind of show up and scare them. You know, they show up in the bedroom. They go through walls. They follow them around. What's interesting, if you pay attention to them, they start moving in on you. They cut coming toward you. So I, I didn't know what these things were. And they started showing up when these the prisoners were using meth and ending up in prison. So I'm like, well, what's this? What's this thing happening now? So I started questioning that. And I said, H have they ever spoken to you? And he said, oh, yeah, they spoke to me. And I said, well, what did they sound like? Because he's the first one who ever said they spoke to him. He said he mimicked this screechy, high-pitched voice that kind of reminded me of rubbing your fingernails on a chalkboard. It kind of gave me the willies, just him mimicking it. And uh, then I went to ask him another question. And all of a sudden, he just went stark still from just shaking like a leaf. The whole time he was in the ER, he just went stark still and his eyes got dark and mm. and and just his pupils just went black and i'm staring into this like this deep dark hatred i mean i've never felt such cold hatred in my life and and it was like and you can't show any fear i mean that that's the last thing you do with these guys you can't show any fear so no, i'm sitting there staring at this entity and i'm like how long is this going to go on and it just seemed like it's lasted forever and then all of a sudden as fast as it came on it disappeared and the guy came back with his normal eyes and normal conversation he started he started shaking again and, and i'm like you were asking too many questions i, I was and they that's didn't why like it, it came on you know? yeah but i'm like but i i, I gotta ask one more i got i need to know more <laughs> You know, so I went, OK, that that thing's over and gone. So I asked him something about uh, what did they tell him to do when when they spoke to him? And uh, he's he said uh, they, they told me to go jump in front of a, a truck and I wouldn't get hurt. And I said, well, what'd you do? He said, well, I, I went and jumped in front of the truck and. I was laying on the side of the road and he said they were surrounding me. They were all around me. They said, get up. You're not hurt. And and I said, well, what, what was the outcome? And he said, I got up and I wasn't hurt. He said, I did it twice. You know, so I'm going one more question, one more question. And I went to ask him and that thing came back, you know, black eyes again. You could tell it was furious with hate, yeah. you know, and it, it was just this cold hatred. Like I've never felt in my life before. And it was like this deep, darkness that just went to infinity and mm -hmm. i'm staring at that like you know yeah i can't break the look i can't you know i had to stare it in the eyes and then once that went away it was like okay no more questions get out of here <laughs> you know? so, so he went back out to the psych annex and the psych nurse came in about five minutes later and she's i can't deal with this guy what'd you get out of him i need to write my report you know so, Jerry, i'll never forget think, that what do you think that was do you think it was an archon or I, do you think it was a demon i have no idea that, i mean i'm talking was. about the shadow shadow people what do oh, you think the shadow that? people i i'm not sure what they are uh you know i started investigating it because the prisoners started showing up with these things and saying right. you know I, I see them i see them w what i found is that the prisoners called them the tree people and they could mm. see them up in the trees you know 
they told me that if they paid attention to them, they started moving toward them. And that none of them stayed around long enough to find out what would happen if they got there. They and all that took goes off. into the the video that you shared on your channel, Jerry, uh, by Cliff High, uh, the interview with Cliff High, where his father was in Vietnam War and uh, they had the the oh, night binoculars. vision goggles. Yeah, the night yeah. vision goggles, but the old night vision goggles were red, and the fighter pilots could see these things on top of the trees yeah. with the red. So they're infrared, yeah. yeah so yeah. they're below the light spectrum. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's. I don't the, know if they were the. I don't know if they were the shadow people or not. But I had one prisoner who told me he said, "I ran an experiment with these things with my buddy." You know, so what they did is they wanted to know if they both were seeing the same shadow person or whether these were individual hallucinations. So they went out to the Indian reservation south of here, middle of nowhere, dirt road. Nobody's there. They brought their meth. They were in a truck. And they, they got out to, and they sh one guy shot up the meth, and he started seeing them in, in the desert. And he'd point to them. He'd go, see that tree over there? Well, what's that one doing over there? You know? Well, I don't see him. Well, what about over there? Do you see anything over there? No. So the guy who didn't shoot up didn't see them. Okay. So the second guy shot up, and then they started comparing notes. You know, well, you see the one over there? Yeah, I see him. What's he doing? Well, he's doing this. How about that one over there? You know, so they, they realized that they had both were both seeing the same things independently. You know, they, they, they compared the notes, and it was like they were – it was the same thing they were saying. But – that, that thing where they move in on you while you're paying attention to them, they weren't paying attention to that. They did. I don't think they knew that was that, that happened. So these things started moving in out of the desert while they were doing this thing, and they were completely surrounded by them. So they got freaked out. They went in the truck. They locked the door. They rolled up the windows, and they're watching them from inside the truck. The guy said that all of a sudden the back of the truck went down like a giant boulder hit it about bam and the front of the truck lifted up they turned around they looked and the whole bed of the truck was full of these things so you know that got my concern because i'm like i didn't think these things could affect physical reality if they could bring the you know knock the back of a truck down and bring the front up then they can affect physical reality so he said that they drove out of the desert as fast as they could almost wrecked a truck my last question to him was did they follow you and he said no so I don't know what they are. You know, I know they're common. I've seen them out of the corner of my eye. You know, all these guys that psychotics see them, schizophrenics see them all the time. Meth addicts are always surrounded by them. You know, they so just what appear. Do you they think scare they people to death. What do you think they are, Laura? The shadow people so it, in particular. So it's like, it's like taking that particular drug puts you in the vibration. Yes. That was your vibration. Yes, so it then opens you, can you see up. Them. Yeah. I would be interested to see what that truck looked like the next day mm. because were they just able to affect that truck because they were both on that mess having that shared reality at that time. Wow. But but could somebody who wasn't on the mess see the same thing? I would be really interested to see the next day. You mean that the, the truck affecting the physical the matter. truck go up so yeah, yeah was, I don't was, I don't was know. It, was there any physical evidence that that had yeah. actually occurred? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Did it just happen in the frequency that they entered mm. when they took that yeah. particular? Like a parallel action. reality. Yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah. have, I've heard a lot about um, the shadow people. I don't know. I, I, I spoke to one patient where they could feel the shadow person walk through them and they yeah. could, they could feel that. You know, but messing, messing with them at night when they're in bed and yeah. My, like my question Just, is, my question is, is that I, I believe that there is some phenomena that is a shape shifter, and and it seems to be able to emulate whatever, almost like you know in Harry Potter how they have the bogart. It sort of emulates yeah. whatever you're afraid of. So it can emulate, for example, so the archons do this. They can emulate your spirit guide. They can emulate Mother Mary. Mm -hmm. They can emulate Jesus. They can emulate uh, a galactic being, a Palladian that you're channeling, or they can emulate 
a ghost. They can pretend to be whatever it is to elicit whatever they need in the long run for the energy that they're going to feed off. They can do that. You know, I've, so I've, I've seen the voices I'm wondering do if that the also. Shadow, yeah, I'm wondering if the shadow people are just one of one aspect of the same thing. That's what I'm thinking. No, I don't think they're the same as the voices that the psychotics hear. You know, because that was the first time I ever heard that they spoke. But um, yeah, the schizophrenic voices can also emulate relatives. Yes. You know, they can e emulate abusers. And I've I've heard this I think three times where the the girl the girl was just badly physically and sexually abused by some guy, some relative. And then he finally died and and they're at the funeral. Okay. And they're going, thank God he's dead and he's out of my way. I don't have to put up with him anymore. And then they hear the, his voice in their heads saying, oh, yeah, you're not done with me. I'm still here. Yeah. Remember when we did this? You know, remember? And that was just absolutely terrifying. It, mm -hmm. it just took a horrendous amount of effort to convince them that that wasn't the dead relative, that that was, you know, this entity milking them for, uh, for their energy. Wow. So, so what, do you have anything to add to that, Laura? The only thing I would add is sometimes the dead relatives will hang around because they don't want to cross. Yeah. And, um, you know, the amount of times that I, I work with people and I will find the earthbound spirits of family members attached. And you get some very, very complex cases as well where, say, for example, um, the mother of a child dies due to taking a heroin overdose. And then the child is obviously distraught that the mother has died. The mother realizes that she's dead and she comes to find the child and they end up bound. So the mm. mother ends up attaching to the child's energy. And then the child ends up growing up and turning into a heroin addict. And she can't understand why she's doing that because her own mother died of it. Why would she mm. do that? But it's because she's been influenced by the needs and the wants of the spirit of the mother that is still attached to her fields. It's, and then you have to facilitate a really heartbreaking conversation between the two of them in session to get the mother to understand that she's not helping the child who's then grown up into an adult by staying attached to them. She must cross over correctly you know, access all of her own power. And if she wants to come back as a guide to help that loved one, then that's something that, that she can do. But she can't stay attached to the energy of that child as an earthbound spirit. And obviously, the child doesn't want to let go of the mother as well. So you have to facilitate some really, really heartbreaking conversations sometimes. Um, that's so, that's so had, complex and so convoluted. And it's it or it can sometimes come as a real shock to people as well when they yeah. don't know that they've got this particular loved one attached. Mm -hmm. I actually had that happen to me on a course, live on a course. So yeah. the person that was my volunteer, um, we found her dad attached to her energetic fields live on the course. Um, so it is something that can happen. In those cases, um this is just, I'm just throwing this question out there, left a field. In those cases, would, you know, sometimes when you go to a medium after someone dies and you want to ask how your father's doing or your mother's doing, um, would the psychic still be able to access the spirit's consciousness if they're attached to? They shouldn't be able to, no, because... Right they've not crossed over correctly they might be able to tell the individual actually your dad's an earthbound spirit if they mm. if they've got that awareness or well, they might but, just not feel them and yeah 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 and people will often report I, i've not been able to make contact with this person's spirits and this since they yeah. passed over and i'm a bit worried about them and then when you ask those questions in session, you actually find out that individual has not crossed over correctly. They're yeah. bound somewhere. But then when you find that out, you can help them to understand that they've died. A lot of people don't understand that they have actually died because yeah. we're not yeah. given any of this guidance, are we? I mean, we're no. just not, we're right. not taught this. So people that in particular die in really traumatic circumstances or intoxicated or 
due to an addiction, they come out of their physical body, but they they they're freeze framed yeah. in whatever state of mind they were in time at the locked. time they came out. Yeah. yeah, and so if you get someone that's died and they are completely inebriated. They don't understand that they're dead. And these are the roaming spirits that will stay uh, in, in houses. Yeah, and houses. I, I actually yeah. had one in my house when yes, I moved in. Yes, I know you. Yes, you told me about that. And he didn't know he was dead, did he? He had no Knocking idea. Knocking on the window. Yep. He was Keith. He was there all the time, yeah. bless him. And, and eventually we, we managed to, to help him. And so, so this takes over. me to addictions and drugs and things of that nature. Um, Jerry, you worked in a lot of prisons. Obviously, there was a lot of uh, uh, heavy drugs and alcoholism in these um, in these prisoners. And so, you've also got this hotbed of trauma, uh, violence, uh, heavy energies. You've got people dying in prison who are possibly drug addicts. Uh, so there would be also a lot of earthbound spirits, but um, yeah. do you find? Um, I don't know what my question is. Basically, I just wanted to bring up the idea of the of drugs and psychosis. Yeah, yeah. Th th there's one story I remember that um, th this this fella he was he what they did, what the they did with the prison. They'd go into a classification center, and then they would figure out what prison they were going to send these guys to. They had one Apache Indian who was a violent alcoholic that not even the Apache police could deal with. And I, I don't know if you guys know what the Apaches are. <laughs> they're, 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 they're a fairly violent tribe. They held off the U.S. Army for decades, you know, in the, in the old days. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they just slaughtered the Army. So they, they're, they're warriors. They're, I mean, they are just violent warriors. And this guy was being sent to my prison unit. So I'm tracking him on the computer. He completely skips the classification center and he blows right into my unit. So I heard he was like an, a, a warped, alcoholic, uh, evil in uh, medicine man kind of guy. You know, that he, uh, he was, so I, I pulled him in and boy, you know, you could just feel the hatred come off him. You know, so I'm like, I just explained, hey, I'll be your psych while you're in this unit. You know, I'll be watching over you. I'll you know, come and bring you in once every every couple of weeks, see how you're doing, make sure everything's fine. And you could just feel the hatred just boil off of him. He's like, I, I the, felt, the feeling I got was I'd, I'd rather just slit your guts open and spread them all over the floor than say another word to you. So I, after that, I went, eh, okay. So I went to the head of the uh, Indian gang out there. I, I, I was, I'd like the Indian, so I helped him out all I could. And he said, I said, what's with this guy? And he said, you, you be careful with him. You know? But my curiosity was like, you know, what's going on with this guy? So I called him back. It was, it was probably six months before I could actually have a 20-minute conversation with him. So, you know, he was a violent alcoholic, and I'd say, he'd tell me all these stories about fighting uh, demons and, and spirits and casting spells and all this kind of stuff. And then I, I kind of worked up my courage, and I said, uh, well, if, if you can do all that kind of stuff, how come you can't stay sober? And I thought, you know, I was like, <laughs> wait, I'm like, you know, okay, okay. you know, I'm so like pins and needles, and he said, it's because of the spirits of dead alcoholics. Yes. He said, yeah, he said, if I go, yeah, he, he was talking about a bar in Phoenix. He said, if he, if he went anywhere near that bar, he said they were, yeah, he could see them piled all up to the sky over that yeah. bar until they disappeared. Yes. And he said, wow. he said, if he, he said, if he even took a little drink or even thought about it, they would just swarm him. And if he took a drink, they would boom, they would go in there and it wasn't him just doing the drinking. Now there was a bunch of them in there going, yeah, we want more. You can just have one more. Yeah, just go. Yeah, they won't serve you in this bar. Go to this other bar. And it's a whole bunch of them Incredible. doing the drinking. So this yep. bring, this brings me to this, this idea of the auric field or um, the etheric uh, you know, there's different layers, so Laura could probably explain it a bit better than me. But I know that I have seen one person I know who is alcoholic and, and tends to attract entities and gather them and attack, you know, all these attachments, etc. And when I look 
in my uh, in a clairvoyant state or in a meditative state, I see massive holes like Swiss cheese all over his energetic field. Okay, so what is it, Laura? Maybe you can explain. What is it that um, that you see, or what is it that makes some people more susceptible to these attachments than others? I mean, this we could go on about this for another whole hour, but you know, whatever yeah, you yeah. can contribute to that. Yeah, and my question is, do they stay? I mean, do they stay if they, if a guy's a drug addict or alcoholic and he cleans up? Do those entities still stay in the auric field, trying to get him to to use? Many will, and I've worked with many ex addicts that um, have said, "Look, I've I've beaten the heroin, I've beaten it," but I. I have these voices still every single day. And no matter what I do, they will not leave me alone, you know, trying to get me to take it again. Um, and I feel this real hardness around my solar plexus. And I don't know what this hardness is. And I, I feel really angry towards the dog and the dog hasn't done anything wrong. And so then you hypnotize that particular person, get them into the theta brainwave state, access the demon, the entity, and they'll say that, she won't do it anymore. She won't take it. I've tried everything. I'm getting so mad. What can I do? The only thing I've got to take it out on is the dog. And all of a sudden, all of the pieces, you know, you, you start to, to, to build the picture up. And a lot of the time, what they will do is once they've claimed a human, mm. so once they feel that that human is theirs, th they see it almost as a challenge. If that person does manage to kick a habit, they will try and steer them down another route. So say, for example, you've got someone that's got a significant sacral demon. Say, say it's a woman and they have to stop drinking because they become pregnant. What you will then find is that person will then develop another significant addictive vice that will take the place of the drinking. And it mm. it's normally goes on to porn. So if that woman gets pregnant and she can't drink anymore, she has to stop. She'll then develop a porn addiction and the porn addiction will be right the way throughout the pregnancy until the baby is born. And then that person will go back to drinking again. And that's because the entity has to change the way that they're siphoning the energy from the woman. They'll find mm. some way to get that energy that they want. And to top it off, the porn, the porn uh, videos also are embedded with demonic entities. Yeah. So that's what they do. They actually cast spells in the porn industry over these uh, videos. So they've got attachments and they hook in to the viewer. And yeah. a lot of those girls, and I'm not saying all of them, because mm -hmm. I know there's a lot that do choose to do it. But a lot of those women in those videos are not there because they are choosing to do it. No. And all of that energy is contained within that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that repeatedly watch porn in the home will open up a dark portal yeah. in their home. And when that happens, what that means is darker energies can freely access the home wherever that is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, our black mirrors are a portal, aren't they? Yeah. You know, right? Yep. That's a portal. Yep to darkness it could be and this is this is all part of that but i, I think um i think you didn't answer my question what was the question that Sorry. i asked you no that's okay uh about uh the holes in the auric field oh yes yeah um yeah so addiction is one massive way that will poke holes through the aura now many people that i see are addicted to cannabis Mm -hmm. And the smoking of cannabis literally opens the aura up like a colander. Ayahuasca as well. Did I you know. hear that, people? <laughs> Sorry, and everyone always says, nothing wrong with cannabis. Sorry, everyone. And I did want um, to bring up ayahuasca. It's on my list. So, yeah, please tell yeah. us. Please, please, please tell us about ayahuasca. Well, some of the worst clients that I have seen in terms of psychosis and um, it ruining their life, basically are people that have done ayahuasca and they they will report having the most euphoric experience um, sometimes or it can just be the most terrifying experience it's kind of one or the other but after that initial experience 
of taking the ayahuasca, from that moment on, they report all of their energy disappears. They've got no energy left anymore. They start to hear the voices. Um, they start to not be able to sleep at night. As soon as they fall into sleep, they feel themselves being poked by something that's trying to keep them awake. And whenever they do sleep, they feel like they're being tortured in the astral realm as well. So you'll get people that are really, really spiritual. They've gone to do this, what they believe is going to be a really amazing experience. And then they end up having their lives completely destroyed. And I've seen this far too many times now for it to be um, a one-off. You know, yeah. So, so is, there it, is, is it, is it no just, way is I'll it from, do it. Is it from, yeah, neither. <laughs> is it a repeated uh, ayahuasca taking or can it happen one time or is this one people? time? One wow. time, yeah. That's yeah. all it and, takes. Just but and I know and I know, listen, I know a couple of spiritual healers um who swear by it. And uh what do you I mean, I warned them, I said, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that. But um if then because that that knowing what I know about ayahuasca and what it does. I then question the validity of the messages they're getting as a result of that ayahuasca journey that they're repeatedly doing. All I can comment on is the people that have come to me that have done ayahuasca and have said, please help me because my life is destroyed. And when I've got them into session and just for, for Jerry, um, I can actually see the entities as well. So when I hypnotize people, I connect to their energy and I can see what's there. And people that have done ayahuasca, they've they've got pretty much every okay. energy center taken. Yeah. Well, I, did, I didn't crowns open up. Yeah. Sorry, go yeah. on. I did an interview with a guy named Frank. It's on my website who was using mm -hmm. ayahuasca. He swore he swore by it. He said he he uh for years he was meeting with positive angelic entities and then one day shapeshifters bam one one got him and and it it took over him and he was he was talking about having to split his consciousness because he couldn't get rid of it so it was in there it was it it, it, it wouldn't much talk but he could he could signal it with his fingers you know and and he could actually bring it out and when he brought it out his face would just get very contorted and 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 nasty so he, he couldn't get rid of it so he, he kind of compartmentalized it so he could function but he couldn't wow. work and he couldn't yeah. hold down he needs a job. to see laura <laughs> yeah <laughs> he needs to get an entity release from laura I, i'm not sure he wants to get rid of it that that's the feeling i got he didn't maybe it's the entity that doesn't want to get rid of him maybe the entity doesn't want to get rid of him and and, and i had one in the in we'll the prison go. that we worked I, I worked with for six months we finally got rid of the voices they they screamed when they left <sighs> you know a few months later i was transferred to another unit i came back to visit him said well how are you he said i got lonely and i went and looked for him they mm -hmm. came back yeah yeah you know and and that's the sad thing because it becomes a symbiotic relationship. So these, yeah. they've been Parasite. together as a yeah as a, a collection for so long that when you remove those entities, if you don't give that client um, the necessary support psychologically to get over the loss, then they may they may attract a brand new set. And yeah. an, exam an example of that would be somebody that um, has a sexual trauma. And it, it really destroys them. And through that sexual trauma, the pain and the sadness of that, they attract a sacral demon. That sacral demon then gives them an edge in the bedroom, mm. gives them the confidence in the bedroom to do things that they potentially wouldn't have done due to this sexual trauma. And so if you take that sacral demon away, that person then loses all of their confidence in the bedroom again. Mm. And will say oh you know i do feel better in myself you know i've got more energy but i just i just i just feel like i've lost my edge and the edge was never theirs the edge was always the mm. demon mm. so yeah. you will get some people that no matter how much you try to help them no matter how much you try to heal them they've just been some they've just become so used to working with that darker energy that darker edge that they can't function without it
Well, I saw that in the prison, and and the most dramatic case was, I mean, they get supernaturally strong. I mean, I've seen a, like a, a, you know, a hundred pound inmate bounce two big guards around the inside of the cell like popcorn. But the big, most dramatic one was at a prison unit in Florence. This is the big prison where there were three stacks of cells and the guards, you know, they're, they're these hot macho control guys. Most of the, a lot of the time they went to this one psychotic guy who was, he was big. He was strong. I mean, and and they're telling him, we're moving you. Cuff up. You know, stick your arms out. Cuff, put your handcuffs on. And he goes, screw you. I'm not moving anywhere. You know, so instead of turning off the water and not feeding the guy until he gives in, no, they, they start a confrontation. Mm -hmm. So now you got three cells of inmates looking down at this confrontation, all of them rooting for the prisoner, of course. And the guards are like, yeah, well, yeah, we'll show you guys, you know. So you, you hear this, they hear this is, you know, getting intense by the moment. And and uh, so they said, you, you you know, cuff up or we're going to get the we're going to get the pepper spray. He goes, screw you. Come out. Come in here and get me. You know, and he starts calling them all kinds of names and calling them fairies and faggots and trying to trigger them. And uh, so, so they get these quart cans of pepper spray. They're like a foot long and about six inches thick. And they, they aim them at him and they start shooting. He wraps a towel around his head and they just drench him and the whole inside of the cell with this stuff. I don't know if you guys ever been around that stuff, but all it takes is a little bit. And you're like, oh, you know, it burns like it's all, your skin is on fire. So he, he takes that off and he goes, uh, you know, they go, now, okay, now come on out. That's whole cell. I mean, they're even suffering because it's blowing out of the cell and getting them. You know? So they said, now come on out. You know, and he goes, no, you, you come on and get me a bunch of fairies. <laughs> so they're like, okay, the show's on. You know, every single inmate in that whole cell block is watching this now. The guards can't back down. They said, you come on out or we're going to go get the stun gun. They go, go get your stun gun. You know, and they start mocking them again. So they get this, this, this 50,000 volts and it shot a little dart that kind of went into the skin with this little thin wire. Oh, and yeah. then it would de deliver a 50,000 volt charge. And with most inmates, I mean, you one charge and they just boom, they're, they're out. It's, it's like some giant baseball bat hit them in the head and they just, they fall out. This guy stood in the middle of the cell and just shook. He just vibrated. He, he would not go down. So they wow. got a second one. They shot him with the second one. Oh. While one was discharging, the other was charging. So they did that, I think it was 13 times. You know, By then, the warden had come down, and there were like about 20 guards there now. And this guy, every time they did it, he just stood in the middle of the cell, and he shook, but he would not go down. Wow. So finally, the warden said, they're going to get me for cruel and unusual punishment. we got to stop this. So... They said, you come on out of there, we're going to get the dog. Now, they have oh, these trained no. attack dogs that just rip them to pieces. I mean, they, they're more afraid of those dogs than anything else. They said, we're going to go get the dog. You don't, you don't cuff up, we're going to get the dog. You know, Screw you and your dog. You know, go get your dog. So they went and got the attack dog. <clears throat> they gave him another chance. They, they had the dog on a, on a rope, on a, a big, thick rope. They slid the cell open long enough, wide enough for the dog to get in, and they ordered him to attack the guy. The guy was sitting on his bed, and as the dog leaped at him, he threw his arm up in front of his face like that. The dog grabbed his wrist and bit down to the bone. You know, so here's the dog pulling on him, and he's, he's gushing blood, and he pulls the dog up to his face, and he goes, sit. And the dog sat. It sat down, but it didn't let go of his arm. And then he started petting the dog with his other arm going, oh, good puppy, good puppy. You know, and the guys outside the cell are going, what the please is this going on in there? You know, so they started pulling on the rope. Dog wouldn't let go of his arm and they drug him out of the cell. And then they beat the crap out of him oh, over there. God. So that shows you how much power these things can give to these psychotic people. I mean, yeah. so we got the worst of the worst in the prison you know yeah. so this is one of the worst cases i've ever seen where, where it was like supernatural strength i mean it made yeah. no sense it made no sense so so for anyone's watch who's watching we've kind of established already that there seems to be a parasitic entity that has invaded our organic reality 
that is slowly but surely affecting and infecting organic matter in this reality and to the point where we are treated almost like puppets and we're being used and abused. They have access to our thoughts. They have access to our cellular memory and they are pitting us against each other in order and they to... they don't want you to wake up and realize this. And they don't That's the want last you to thing they up. want you to know. And they're terraforming our realm energetically through the food, through chemicals, through what have you, to try to create and obliterate anything that is heart-centered and organic uh, and to sort of fuse or to to replicate themselves within us in our reality. So I will ask uh, two last questions before we wrap up because it's getting very late for Laura. What are thoughts, therefore, if they access our thoughts? I've thought about we this could a lot. Talk, I, I, I mean, I yeah. think I posed this to you the other day, Laura, and I started saying, are thoughts photons of light? Are they? They're, they're energy. They're energy. They're energy. And we're all we're all connected in consciousness. This is the yes. thing. Yes. We're a collective consciousness. And this is what they don't tell us. We're all connected. That's so how we they're can connect hear the voices in the hypnotherapy. Is, yeah. So everything's it, connected. If we, so if we're connected as a species together, and we're also connected to these parasites that are connected to us because they're feeding off of us. At any point, you can have that thought pop in your head that is the most mm -hmm. low frequency, disgusting, horrific thing, and it will pop in. And it's like, where did that come from? Absolutely that. And when you are a stable individual, you can think to yourself, well, whew, that doesn't belong to me. That's not mine. <laughs> yeah, right. Off you right. go. You Good know, don't, don't, yep. don't, don't know where that came from, but it's on your way. Mine. Yeah. Right. But if you're somebody that's um, energetically low and anxious because you've got your root energy center that's completely parasited away. So you, you feel believe very, it's yours. Yeah. You've got no solar plexus energy because a demon's taking it. So you've got no confidence. You've got no throat to, peak, uh, to speak out because you've got a throat demon in there. And all of a sudden, this horrendous thought pops in your head you start to question yourself and you think, do do I think that? Or is that about me? And that's how they slowly erode through our consciousness and through our energy and through the food and through everything. And because we are connected in consciousness, they get to us that way. Exactly. They want you to think that their thoughts are your thoughts and that they are you. Yeah. You know. So it's so I yeah, sorry, go on, Laura. I always say to everybody, whatever pops into your head, observe the thought. Yes. Observe it and think, okay, do I align with that thought? Is that something this is that what Jerry yeah. Jerry's yeah. Uh, You're the chooser. You're the chooser. So Jerry's co author, you Sherry Sweeney, uh has a it, uh, is that what is the, the program called? It's a lie, or well, that's a lie program. That's a lie. So it's the same thing right. you're saying, Laura. So, so it you, you can't ignore them. You know, if you if you yeah. ignore it, it gets stronger. What you resist persists. The brilliance is, I I saw these things were liars. You know, decades ago, but Sherry came up with this. She heard these voices when she was a young woman, and she beat them with that program alone, just by. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's not true, you know. And then they can't get you. It's it's like they can't get their hooks in you when you don't believe anything they say. And I don't know how many prisoners had told me, and and in the psych wards too, they would ask these things: "Who are you? What are you?" And they would say, "We are you. We are you." They want you to believe that those thoughts are yours, that they are you, and and. That those thoughts come from you. And because we have this dual realm where there's a whole bunch of really good people, but there's a whole bunch of really, really evil, sadistic, nasty people. And then beyond that, there's a whole bunch of energetic parasites that are really evil. If we're all bunched together as one collective consciousness 
and this appears almost like mm. an antenna for energy and consciousness yeah. you know you might be having a bit of a bad day you might have dropped your frequency a little bit and all of a sudden a thought might pop in there yeah that doesn't belong to you but because you're having a bad day you know you start to ride with it a little bit mm -hmm. it affects your energy mm -hmm. takes your emotions yeah. down and before you know it they've managed to find a way to get in and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so you start watching for something that will reinforce that thought yeah yeah i find that uh if i'm particularly tired if i've spent too much time on my phone or with technology um I can get affected by thoughts that are not my own and not necessarily thoughts that are conscious. It might come up in dreams. I never have nightmares and I knew that something was trying to get to me before this interview. I mean, for the last two days, I could feel that they were trying to stop me from doing this interview. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm sure they're I not going to like this. I had no. the worst <laughs> yeah, nightmare. No. Laura, I didn't tell you this. I had the worst nightmares the other night uh just the night before last, uh, like because it's early morning here but the night before last night the worst violent blood uh, full of blood really horrific oh. awful things to the point where i heard an audible voice wake me up yeah wow. and say my name three times to wake up during this really horrific dream of uh, like full of blood and and whatever um, and it was just constant. It was like torturing animals being tortured, just images of animals. Being, and I had not been looking at anything violent. I don't partake in anything like that. I don't see anything like that. It's not like I was watching a movie and I don't watch movies. I don't watch TV. Um, but these thoughts were being put in my head and I knew, and because I know how they work, I'm like, I was very tired today and they came in through uh, social media or whatever it was, you know, through the through the devices that I had, and I just didn't clear myself before I went to bed. You know, I went to bed very tired. I'd been up late, um, so I knew what it was. But the problem is, is that uh, this is happening a lot to to children, to young people, to people who aren't aware that there is another another realm. And so, uh, the last question I'll ask you both is: uh, Is there if people are hearing, and I'm seeing this happening in a lot of young people, psychosis and schizophrenia is really rampant, particularly with children who have other conditions such as autism. My daughter has autism. Thank God she's not hearing anything. Uh, you know, she's only young, but I keep hearing that there are kids with multiple conditions and there's usually psychosis with it. So... Is this reversible? Can we heal? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. See, psychiatry Absolutely. doesn't want you to believe that that's so. But, yes, you know, I've had a number of people completely reverse, and I'm sure Laura's got a lot more. Yep. And I have seen it. Um, the, the How would I say this? The changes that I have seen in children when you take these things away from children is unbelievable so how you will get a child who is um very aggressive very nasty potentially quite spiteful starting picking fights with people uh, fighting over toys all that kind of thing mm. you do an entity release take those entities away that child then you see the true child heart-centered loving present um, yeah yeah absolutely present calm no anxiety, no intense nastiness. You can almost see it in the children when they've got something demonic attached. Um, and with my own children, I can tell the second that they have brought something home. Yeah. The second. Well, and, and, and I want to bring up what psychiatry is doing with these kind of kids. You know, as of 200, 2017, over a million kids in the United States under the age of six have been put on psychiatric drugs. <sighs> six, six, 622,723 are under the age of five. 80,000 are on ADHD drugs or amphetamines. This is what we were talking about yeah, earlier. Amphetamines. It opens up the, the, the field. Over 38,000 are on antidepressants. 
85,000 are on antipsychotics. And these are some of the most toxic drugs used in medicine today. 389,000 are on anxiety drugs. The, the, the antidepressant drugs in the United States, they're expected to reach a profit of uh, or a sales number of uh, 15 Point ninety eight billion. That's fifteen point ninety eight billion dollars by twenty twenty three. Anti psychotic drug sales hit fourteen point five four billion in two thousand twenty one, and is expected to reach fifteen point five billion by two thousand twenty two. Can you imagine how many drugs they're pouring into society? And these are toxic. These are poisonous drugs. They don't cure anything. Oh, no. But they don't want to cure anything. They don't want to cure anything. Mm -hmm. You look at you look at the funding that NIMH is giving for schizophrenia research. It's a dribble. They've taken away. They've manipulated the statistics to make it look like there's a lot less psychotics in the United States than there actually are. Yeah. You know, they they, they don't want a cure. They want to make money and they want power. Yeah. It, it, it's it's disgusting what they're doing. It's it's I've, I spent my entire life in mental health, and it's a, it's the biggest scam drug fueled merigo round i've ever seen in my life they bring these people into these psych hospitals they fill them full of these drugs they can't stand them they go off those drugs they get psychotic again they bring them back fill them up again blah blah blah, blah until they get sent to prison and once they're in prison that's a devil's that's a devil's territory there yeah they don't come out the same so if you guys uh look in the <laughs> There's Laura when she had her glasses. So uh, if you look in the links below this video, I will share with you both Jerry Mazinski's links and Laura Whitworth's links. So if you go to schhofficial.com, you'll find Laura's website and she does have her services there. I believe, I know on the phone, that if we scroll to the bottom of this first page, you will find the practitioners that also practice soul center healing hypnosis <laughs> you can book in with laura she is here they are the practitioners worldwide uh you can book in with and they don't have to be in the same country as you let me just explain this everybody this is done via zoom it's done via zoom a, a zoom meeting okay so they do not have to be in the same country as you you don't see them physically unless they're offering that um, and you've got people all over the world who are qualified practitioners of this. You can get Laura to do this with you as well. It is a long waiting list. I don't know how long your waiting list is at the moment, Laura. Um, booked out to September, so I'm taking people for September, yeah. Wow. September, wow. okay, because this is, as you can already tell, hours and hours and hours with you in each session. Okay, so uh, it's very important that you all understand that and that you value this work that uh, these practitioners are doing. Um, Laura also has some courses coming up as well, which I have done myself. Um, and and in regards to doing the courses, you know, we, we, there's a lot of hours that need to be built up before the practitioner can practice on you properly. Um, Jerry, if you could see his website, Jerry, you're taking some clients, aren't you? You're seeing some clients. Yes. yes. Yeah. So you can go to contact Jerry or online consultation. Yeah. And and I'm I'm working with a, an energetic system called the Mace Energy System. That's that right. Mm -hmm. It goes into it, it finds the trauma, it dispels it. So that's one of the things that needs to be done before you you can you know, get get rid of the voices because that that stuff gets programmed in, and and it just keeps repeating over and over and and gets worse and worse. Yeah. Um, and I should have brought the Mace Energy Method up on the website, but I forgot to do that. But I'll put a link for that one below as well. Um, guys, this was been fantastic. Is there any last words that you want to say to the audience? Because in my I mean, I can tell that's, that psychosis and these other mental health issues are rampant in, our, uh, in the community because every second audience member, and I'm very closely, you know, talking to my audience all the time, every second audience member is touched by this. 
Um, you know, I myself, my daughter with autism, at the age of four when she got diagnosed, the paediatrician wanted to put her on Ritalin and she wasn't diagnosed for ADHD. You know, I mean, four no, years old. No. Okay. And she said, it's even ridiculous. though she's young, you know, so I know mental health and, and these uh, conditions uh, and, and the drug industry, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is really running rampant with people. But both of you are showing to the world that we can shift this and move from this parasitic control yeah. to back to the organic. Uh, Laura, anything you want to say, the last things you want to say? Yeah. When people understand that the traumas that they have experienced and the emotions that they have faced and held on to around those traumas, when they understand that those traumas affect their energetic body and magnetize these parasitic beings to that pain-filled light, so your emotional pain goes into the, to the energy centers, these parasitical beings are attracted to those energy centers and they then attach to the energy centers and siphon your energy away. When you don't have access to the certain energy centers in your body, ultimately what you're going to end up facing is physical ailments in that area. That's probably going to be the first time that you will notice that anything's wrong. You will have a physical ailment in that area. And what everybody has to understand is you can completely heal that physical ailment by having these entities removed, by healing the trauma, the initial trauma that you um, were subjected to that opened you up. Everybody's got to heal themselves, heal their traumas, take our energy bodies back unpick these parasites, say, no, thank you. This is our free will choice. This is a free will planet, whatever realm. We don't we don't want you. And then when we all start to vibrate higher, I believe that this collective consciousness that we're in together currently, which is like a bit of a soup, as we begin to vibrate higher, we go this way. Those guys are consistently vibrating lower and lower and lower because of everything that the powers that be are doing. At a certain point, these two very different streams of consciousness are not going to be able to stay connected because they will repel each other, because they will be so dissonant. And that is the split. That, in my opinion, is the ascension. That's what it is. It's us choosing that higher consciousness stream. And then we create our own collective consciousness and when those guys aren't a part of our collective consciousness anymore when we're vibrating higher they won't be able to come anywhere near us that is ascension that is us moving to that higher frequency and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do because I wanted to do something in the time of ascension to help humanity and I feel that this work is exactly that brilliant Jerry, any last words you want to say? Thank you, Laura. Well, you know, what I want to say is what I've seen is during a trauma, the the attention of the individual turns on themselves. So they're 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 watching themselves, and they are making some decisions based on that trauma about who they are. You know, how did I get into this mess? How do I get out of this mess? Who am I in relation to this? You know, you got sexual abuse, physical abuse, you know. So they make these decisions about who they are based on this trauma. And, and it's very painful. The, the ego comes and says, let me handle this. And it goes and it buries that stuff in the subconscious. So you're not aware of it. It's buried alive and it's still active. So what you have is this person for in most people, there's this particular type of person that every time they come around, they set you off. And no matter where you go, that person shows up, that that kind of person shows up. That's because you've got these buried traumas in there that you're looking through like dirty sunglasses and you're viewing the your world based on that. But who you are really is pure energy. You know, these things thwart your energy, these programs. and 
the MACE system can go in there, it can dissolve those things quickly and easily, and that you're free of that. That that person would disappear, and you have that energy back because it takes a lot of energy to hold it in there. And that's got nothing to do with demons. You're just holding that, that junk in there like a dam, and it's wanting to get out. So when somebody comes around and threatens that, you either run or you fight with them. You know, And it's all these different kinds of traumas. Once that's cleared out, then you're, you're a pure energy, the, the purest energy there is. You know, and there's ways to get rid of that quickly and easily. The the, the regular psychotherapy stuff, it, it doesn't work. You just keep repeating the same stuff over and over and over again. It just makes it worse. It opens up that festering sore, but it doesn't get rid of anything. And neither do these friggin' drugs that the, the psychiatrists are just pouring on the kids. On And you're not going to go into a psychiatrist's office and come out without a prescription for some stupid drug. You know, and these antipsychotics are some of the most dangerous drugs used in medicine today. They rot out your peripheral nervous system. They rot out your brain. They shrink it like a a, a, a walnut. And you know, of course, the when they discovered that, the psychiatrist and big pharma went, "Oh no, no, it's it's not it's not our drugs. It's the schizophrenia." They don't even know what schizophrenia is. They have no idea. You know. It, 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 that these these patients that have been taking these drugs for years, they do an autopsy on them, their their brains were shrunk. So yeah, here comes the psychiatry and big pharma. It's not us. It's not us. So they started feeding the, the antipsychotics to rats and mice and and monkeys. Their brains shrunk too. So these people are actually poisoning people with these drugs. Now there's people who need to be on those drugs. Believe me, I've seen them in prison. The prison's full of them. You know, they need those drugs to, to calm them down, you know, but that should not be a treatment. That should not be a long standing treatment. It should be an emergency message thing that, you know, to keep maybe the most violent of them down or, or to just for, for a while to, to, to hold them down until somebody like Laura or myself can reach them. Because if they get too psychotic, you can't even reach them. It, it should be a stopgap measure. It shouldn't be giving kids you know, thousands and thousands of kids, these toxic drugs, they're, they're actually destroying the brains on these people. It, 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 the Western Mental Health Center is a drug-fueled joke. It does not work. It, it's for control and money of the psychiatry and, and, and the big pharma and the power brokers that, that have bought off. They bought off Congress to make all these laws to allow them to do these things. It, it, yeah, I don't know. It's it's disgusting. Well, with that, um, I just want to thank you both for your incredible wealth of knowledge and for the time that you've given me today and for the audience. And I'm so proud of both of you for the work that you do for The Light. Uh, you are the pioneers of changing the face of this world and I'm just so grateful that I have a platform I get to speak to you. I get to speak to these two people who I thoroughly, you know, I love this topic and anything to help the people is what we're here about. So I'm giving you this platform to do this and I'm so grateful that you've done this. Uh, please put your comments below, everybody. Let us know what you think. Um, let us know if you have any theories about this realm and what thoughts are, for example, and please um, check the links for both Jerry Mazinski and Laura Whitworth and uh, also empower yourself every day. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you both later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.